profound and devastating impact throughout our country. This is the second hearing in this committee's impeachment proceedings regarding Secretary Mayorkas. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Last week, this committee <coughs> opened impeachment proceedings against Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This is not a policy difference. The truth is, Secretary Mayorkas has disregarded court orders, laws passed by the United States Congress, and has lied to the American people. Who wants a secretary that can just disregard the fundamental pillars of the Constitution? We can't tolerate that, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. That's what we got out of our hearing last week. Today, we're here to examine the impact of those actions on the American people and launch into the substance and human cost of Secretary Mayorkas' open border policies. As a result of the reckless actions by Secretary Mayorkas, no American is safe. There is a fentanyl epidemic sweeping this nation. Roughly 150,000 Americans died from fentanyl poisoning in 21 and 22. That's more than the number of U.S. combat deaths in World War I and the Vietnam War combined. Fentanyl is ripping apart our families and destroying our communities. Over 50% of this poison is being smuggled from Mexico into Arizona before it's dispersed throughout the United States. The Grand Canyon State is on the front lines of this crisis, which is why we have um, had testimony by people who have related the impacts on that state. Now, you'll hear many of my colleagues on the left claim that fentanyl is a ports of entry problem. But in reality, just last year, the Border Patrol intercepted enough fentanyl between the ports of entry to kill every single American. And that's just what we've caught. We have no idea how much more fentanyl was brought in by the nearly 1.8 million known gotaways, not to mention the unknown gotaways. Border officials have told this committee in testimony that only 5 to 10 percent of the fentanyl coming across the border is actually seized. By redirecting so many Border Patrol agents from patrolling the border to assist with the processing and release of illegal aliens, Secretary Mayorkas has made it far easier to smuggle fentanyl across the southwest border. Because of Secretary Mayorkas's border crisis, American cities and neighborhoods are less safe. Secretary Mayorkas's refusal to enforce the law which requires him to detain and remove illegal aliens has tragically increased crime and endangered public safety across the country. Since fiscal year 2021, the Border Patrol arrested more than 41,000 aliens with criminal convictions, including more than 15,000 in fiscal year 23. That's up from just a little over 4,200 in FY 2019. Total convictions for assault, battery, and domestic violence among illegal aliens apprehended in FY23 exceeded 1,200 compared to 299 in FY19. These statistics do not reflect the illegal aliens with criminal records who have slipped through the system because agents just don't have enough time or information to vet them. Additionally, DHS has no way to determine if an alien has a criminal history in his home country unless that country reports the information to the United States government or the alien self-reports. Therefore, DHS is mainly only screening aliens at the border to determine if they have previously committed a crime in the United States. And because many of these aliens are coming to the United States for the first time, DHS has no idea whether they have a criminal history or not. On top of rushing the vetting process, Secretary Mayorkas is hamstringing ICE making it easier for illegal aliens who commit crimes in the United States to stay here. Despite his supposed pledge to focus on removing threats to public safety, ICE is arresting fewer criminal illegal aliens than previous administrations. In FY 2019, out of more than 143 administrative arrests, 86% were of criminal aliens. In FY 20, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was 90%. Last physical year, a mere 43%. The consequences of this influx of criminal aliens is simply devastating. Again, as a result, no American is safe. 
Illegal aliens arriving in major cities like New York and Chicago are committing assault, theft, and even more heinous crimes. In one case, Daniel Hernandez Martinez, who arrived in New York in June 2023, has since committed at least 14 crimes, leading to six arrests, including the day after he arrived in, the, in New York City. In one instance, he, quote, grabbed a stranger by the hair, dragged her across the floor, and kicked her, end quote. Crimes stemming from illegal migrants are also happening in small towns across America. In May 2023, a Honduran national was charged with raping a teenage girl in a restaurant bathroom in Prattsville, Alabama. He had a prior criminal record in Honduras when apprehended, crossing into Texas illegally in November 21, but he was released into the interior anyway. As we learned in last week's hearing, as many as 85% of illegal aliens are currently being released on Secretary Mayorkas's watch. The Secretary himself admitted this during a trip to Eagle Pass just last week. And how could we forget the story of the Tambunga family? Alyssa Tambunga and her father and sister who sat across from us in this very hearing room. Alyssa lost her little seven-year-old Amelia and her grandmother Maria in a car crash caused by a human smuggler. We will sadly hear similar stories today. These crimes were wholly preventable, yet Secretary Mayorkas' policies enabled these criminals to enter our country and destroy these families' lives. It's despicable. While many of my Democrat colleagues likely feel the same sympathy for you and your family that I do, I'd like to ask them to please turn that sympathy into action. It is hypocritical to come up here, offer your thoughts and prayers, and then leave, continuing to double down on the policies that allow criminals and fentanyl into our country. The people suffering from this border crisis don't need platitudes. They need an end to these illegal policies and to see the man responsible for implementing them held to account. And that's what Republicans are doing here today. Migrants are also suffering as a result of Secretary Mayorkas' actions. On Secretary Mayorkas' watch, a record number of migrants have been found dead on U.S. soil. Since the start of FY 2022, CBP no longer even publicly reports the number but Dr. Corrine Stern, the medical examiner in Webb County, Texas, said in August 22, and I quote, I'm seeing an extreme increase in the number of border crossing deaths compared to other years. This is my busiest year in my career ever, end quote. Many of those who survived the journey have horror stories as well. Sadly, numerous migrants suffer sexual abuse and assault along the way. Then San Diego Sector Chief Patrol Agent Aaron Heitke, told our committee in May, and I quote, it's very common that female migrants are raped during the process. Most of them believe it's just part of the payment as they go up, end quote. This hearing is about the human cost of Secretary Mayorkas' egregious misconduct and failure to fulfill his oath of office. The framers of our Constitution were clear that the executive branch officials were expected to follow their duty and enforce the laws of this country, and if they willfully failed to do so, they should no longer hold office. That is why we're here today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and letting them tell their stories about how this crisis has impacted them. Unfortunately, one of our witnesses, Sheriff Daniels, was not able to make it at the last minute. But we look forward to hearing from him at a future hearing or on a future border trip. With his permission, I would ask unanimous consent to submit his testimony for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Lastly, I'd like to point out that I have invited Secretary Mayorkas on multiple occasions to testify on the border crisis, including this hearing today. I'm disappointed that he has chosen not to testify. Instead, he plays games and cat and mouse, telling the media he wants to cooperate with the committee on finding a time to testify, but then refuses to work with the committee staff or offer any dates or times to which he can testify. Despite this behavior and in lieu of his in-person testimony, I have invited him to submit testimony for the record, and I sincerely hope that he takes advantage of that offer. <clears throat> I'd like to ask unanimous consent for my letters inviting Secretary Mayorkas for testimony dated August 16, September 14, January 5, and January 7 to be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Before we begin today's hearing, I want to address misinformation my Republican colleagues are spreading, falsely alleging that Secretary Mayorkas is refusing to testify before this committee. Let me set the record straight. 
Secretary Mayorkas has testified before Congress more than any other cabinet secretary. He's appeared before this committee twice in the last year, including just two months ago when he testified for several hours about border security. His willingness to work with the committee has been a welcome change from the Trump administration, whose official consistently refused to comply with congressional oversight. They ignored virtually every oversight letter and even defied a subpoena for their so-called acting secretary to appear before the committee. Secretary Mayorkas, however, has been forthright in dealing with Congress. In response to the chairman's request to testify at today's hearing on January 11th, 2024, the secretary sent a letter agreeing to make himself available to testify at a future mutually agreed on date. However, the chairman has refused to accept. Instead, Republicans sent angry letters and tweets accusing the secretary of refusing to testify, knowing full well he said he would appear. Republicans are acting in bad faith. Unfortunately, that's nothing new. Months ago, Chairman Green promised donors at a campaign event that he'd bring an impeachment case against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. He told his contributors to, quote, get the popcorn and promised it's going to be fun, unquote. Before the committee had even begun its inquiry, Republicans had predetermined the outcome. But why did Republicans invite the secretary to testify only to refuse his offer to appear? The answer to that question appeared in the Hill newspaper last night. Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record this article from the Hill describing how Republicans had set the date for the markup of articles of impeachment before holding the first hearing on this subject. Uh, Without objection, so ordered. According to an internal Republican memo dated January 10, 2024, Republicans had already scheduled a committee vote to impeach the secretary prior to holding a single impeachment hearing. Just as we've said all along, the outcome of Republicans' so-called impeachment investigation has been predetermined from the start. The chairman promised to follow the facts, but Republicans never really intended to do so. They are hurrying to adhere to an artificial timeline agreed in a backroom deal between Republican leadership who's holding on by a thread and its most extreme mega members. This isn't a real impeachment. It's a mega spectacle paid for by American tax dollars for Republican political gain. But through it all, Secretary Mayorkas remained committed to doing his job. The Department of Homeland Security's mission and the men and women who serve with him at DHS. The Secretary is also committed to work diligently on a bipartisan basis to secure necessary funding for border security and to prepare the Department for a possible shutdown. I wish my Republican colleagues would engage the Secretary to provide the Department the funding it needs, but they have refused. I look forward to continuing to work with Secretary Mayorkas on critical homeland security issues <clears throat> facing the country and commend him for his unwavering commitment to duty even in the face of this sham impeachment. I also <clears throat> note for the record that when I asked at last week's hearing about providing a secretary due process during the committee's impeachment proceedings, the chairman gave no substantive answers to my repeated inquiries. In fact, he seemed to have even considered providing the secretary due process and appeared unprepared to respond. This is unfortunate, but not surprising. Again, this isn't a real impeachment. It's a predetermined, pre-planned, partisan political stunt. Yesterday, the chairman threatened to hold Secretary Mayorkas in contempt for failing to appear before the committee, even though the secretary has already agreed to appear. That's not how contempt works. I can't help but wonder if Republicans are getting 
a bit desperate, especially after their hearing last week was a flop. It fell flat after their witnesses, three Republican politicians, rehashed old partisan talking points without so much as a shred of evidence to support their politically motivated claims for impeachment. The Democratic witness, respected impeachment expert and constitutional scholar, professional Professor Frank Bowman, testified, and I quote, policy differences, no matter how severe, no matter how heated, are simply not grounds for impeachment, unquote. You cannot impeach a cabinet secretary because you don't like a president's policies. That's not what impeachment is for. That's not what the Constitution says. Unfortunately, Republicans are willing to damage the Constitution they claim to hold dear because they think it will benefit them politically. Which brings us to today's hearing. I want to begin by expressing my deepest sympathies to Mrs. Noble and Mrs. Dunn on the tragic loss of your children. I cannot fathom your pain. As a father and a grandfather, my heart truly goes out to you. Indeed, our hearts go out to all those who've lost loved ones to drugs and violence, and we are committed to helping prevent future tragedies. Democrats want to strengthen border security. We want to keep fentanyl off our streets. We want to keep communities safe. We want to help those struggling with addiction. But impeachment will not do any of that. The fact is impeachment is a waste of precious time that could be used to legislate on the urgent issues if only Republicans were willing to do. The Democratic witness today, Professor De Deborah Perlstein, is a constitutional law scholar, but in addition to her knowledge of impeachment, she's great expertise on the awesome power vested in Congress by the Constitution to effect change for the American people. That power is not through impeachment. As Professor Pearlstein stated in her testimony, and I quote, impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas can have no impact on the administration's exercise of immigration enforcement discretion, a power the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized is vested by the Constitution in the executive branch, unquote. Instead, Congress power comes from its ability to legislate. As Professor Pearlstein goes on to say, quote, no branch of government has more power under our Constitution to address matters of border security than Congress, unquote. In other words, it's up to Congress to provide funding to interdict fentanyl, fix our broken immigration system, and provide help for those suffering from opioid addiction. That's our role in this, to use the power provided under the Constitution to legislate on important issues, to help people who need it most, and not some baseless, senseless impeachment. I look forward to hearing from Professor Pearlstein about Congress's power to make meaningful progress on these and other issues. Mr. Chairman, I made this plea to you last week. It fell on deaf ears, but I'll try again. Let's drop this baseless impeachment and get back to doing the real work of securing the homeland and helping people across this great country. Uh, before I yield back, Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. I'd you're, like to give recognized. you another chance at this one. You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, during our hearing last week, you said, quote, the committee will follow the rules of the House, end quote, with regard to Secretary Mayorkas' due process. What provisions of House Rule 11 grants the Secretary representation before this committee? Just a question of clarification on the parliamentary proceeding. What rule are you citing? Rule 11. Rule 11. 
The secretary is not appearing before the committee today, so his counsel is not necessary. Mr. Chairman, we all know that Secretary Mayorkas has been willing to appear before this committee. He's not running from anything. He's been to the Capitol Hill 27 times since he was sworn in. My question is about due process, and there's nothing in the standing House rules that protects the Secretary's rights. So, Mr. Chairman, pursuant to Clause 2J1 of Rule 11, I'm furnishing you with a demand for a minority day hearing on this subject, signed by all the Democratic members of this committee. So the demand is not proper. You have a witness present, so. Uh, uh, before, right? Yeah, this is the unanimous consent that include in the record the article. But also, I have this request for the. Uh, you want this included in the record? Is that what you're asking? Well, that's a request to, for a minority day for the committee. OK. So as I understand the rules, the request is only in order when you don't have a witness present. And today, you have a witness present. So it, this is not <clears throat> in order. Mr. Chairman, may I make a parliamentary inquiry yeah. on that? Yeah. Is this an impeachment inquiry? You want to read the request? Um, yeah, this, this is actually a hearing, not an inquiry. Is this part of an impeachment investigation? This is an impeachment hearing. Okay. Under impeachment precedent, separate and apart from this particular hearing, the minority is allowed to have a hearing of its own choice and its own witnesses. That has happened in every single impeachment in history. If this is going to be an impeachment process, then there have to be rights and due process afforded to the individual who is being impeached. And part of that, historically, under historic precedent, is that there is a minority day with minority determined witnesses, not a minority witness who's added to a hearing that the majority determines. So I want to make clear this uh, supposed misinformation about uh, the request to Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, there have been multiple, multiple requests, four in fact, of me to ask him to come and be a part of this. And he has, to the press, said yes, to me, not provided any dates, in, uh, some date in the future. You can't, that's, that's stonewalling. And, and so at, at some point after four, I finally said, I guess it was Monday, well, just send us a testimony in writing. So far, we haven't seen that either. The, the effort to give Secretary Mayorkas an opportunity to come before the committee in this context has been made many times. I appreciate that the ranking member pointed out that he has been in front of our committee, but that was mandated by, you know, the threats briefing. That's what he came for was the threats briefing, not a part of this investigation on the southwest border. Every time we've invited him, he has refused to give us a date to come. So he's been afforded an opportunity to come. I understand that, and that's a separate issue, uh, whether or not Mr. Mayorkas wants to take part in his own impeachment inquiry. But the question for you is that, as part of the House impeachment process, there must be afforded to the minority a hearing that the minority gets to uh, determine because it's an impeachment process, it is not an, a normal oversight investigation. What Mayorka, Secretary Mayorkas wants to do is a separate matter. I understand your, your view, and I understand you know, the ranking member has, has a, a different view. Um, I, I'm sure we will get all of the different letters in the record, and you know, I have an article here saying that the DHS letter contradicts the GOP claim that Mayorkas refused to testify, which I could enter by unanimous consent. But we're just talking right now about the impeachment process. And in this committee, where it has never been done before, it's normally in the Judiciary Committee, 
that there has to be a minority day with minority determined witnesses. I appreciate the letter um, and we'll take it into consideration. And Mr. Um, uh, Ranking Member, you're recognized for the remainder of your opening. Well, statement. let me ask unanimous consent that that be included in the record. The Without request. objection, so ordered. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Rule 11 does not mention anything about having a minority witness at any given hearing. It only provides for a minority day. I refer the chair to page 599 of the House Rules Manual. Wait, were you asking a question, Mr. Ranking Member? Yes, I mean, we didn't ask about a witness, we asked for a date. Yes, I, I, I saw the letter, we've entered it into the record, and we want to continue with this hearing. We'll address that later. No. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, this committee cannot proceed uh, to any marker. I know you have long, that you have long planned, in which you committed to the speaker and to a member of this committee, uh, behind closed doors without a full hearing, or the merits of impeachment, but a minority day on an impeachment is allowed by the rules. Thank you. And so we're just trying to. No, I appreciate you. Uh, mentioning. Do you plan to honor that? Uh, we'll take. We're going to take it into consideration, and I'll meet with you later to talk about it. Well, I mean, I, do you have any? Do you have any other comments well, for your well, opening remarks? It, it's a. It's a simple uh, request. It's in the rules, and we just want the rules to be followed. There's an interpretation disagreement on this. Um, our parliamentarian says that you're entitled to witnesses and not a specific hearing. We'll, we'll take a look at it after this, and you and I can uh, talk about it then. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, will you yield for uh, a question? I just want to make sure, because I don't think it was entered into the record before, um, the ranking member referred to the letter that uh, Council, is, or that Council of Secretary Mayorkas sent yeah, to I, the committee on January if I, 11th. If I could, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Magaziner, uh, this is his opening statement, not, not his five minutes. He can yield time to you in his five minutes. Okay. I was just going to ask unanimous consent that the letter be entered into the record. but I'm fine with that. Um, we'll break protocol here just a second. If there's no objection, so ordered. Mr. Ranking Member, you're recognized still. The Ranking Member yields. Thank you. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I'm pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today. I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may be seated. I would now like to formally introduce our witnesses. Ms. Tammy Nobles. Ms. Nobles is the mother of a young Maryland woman, Kyla Hamilton, who was raped and murdered in July 2022 allegedly by a 17-year-old El Salvador native and MS-13 member who had illegally crossed the southwest border in March 2022 as an unaccompanied alien child. Ms. Dunn is an Arizona mother who lost her 26-year-old daughter, Ashley Dunn, to fentanyl poisoning in 2021. Since her daughter's passing, Josephine has become an advocate working to stem the scourge that fentanyl is wrecking in the United States. Ms. Deborah Pearlson, Pearlstein um, is the director of the Princeton Program in Law and Public Policy and Charles and Marie Robertson, visiting professor of law and public affairs. Before joining Princeton, she was professor of law and co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy at Cardoza Law School, Yeshiva University, and held visiting appointments at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and Georgetown University Law Center. I thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I now recognize Ms. Nobles for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. 
Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Tammy Nobles. I am the mother of Kayla Hamilton. July 24, 2002 was one of the best days of my life. I gave birth to a beautiful baby girl and named her Kayla Marie. She loved to smile and laugh. She always kept her friends close and never forgot anyone. She was kind, caring, thoughtful, and funny. She loved God. She loved life and God. She showed the world that being yourself was okay and you didn't have to follow everyone else. But sadly, on July 27th, 2022, I received the worst news that a parent doesn't want to hear, that my newly 20-year-old daughter, Kayla Hamilton, was murdered in her own room and left on the floor like trash. The illegal MS-13 known gang member brutally raped and murdered my daughter by strangling her with a cord and robbed her of $6. During the attack, Kayla called her boyfriend for help, but went to voicemail. The voicemail of the murderer strangling Kayla was two minutes and 30 seconds long. DHS employees failed to visually inspect the assailant by lifting his shirt to check for gang-related tattoos. Had DHS employee, employees performed a visual inspection of the assailant's body, they would have seen MS-13 gang-related tattoos on his body. Disqualifying, disqualifying him from entering the U.S. DHS employees failed to make a simple phone call to the El Salvador government to verify if assailant was on an MS-13 gain affiliation list. Had they done so, El Salvador government officials would have confirmed that the assailant was a known MS-13 gang member with a prior criminal history. DHS supervisors have failed to train and supervise DHS employees to properly screen minors attempting to enter U.S. soil from El Salvador. The operational neglect committed by DHS carried over into DHHS, whose operational neglect further sealed my daughter's fate. DHHS's operational neglect included its employees violating clearly articulated protocol requiring a minor to be placed with a verified relative before entering the U.S. DHHS employees neglected and recklessly failed to verify a legitimate family member of the assailant or sponsor before allowing him to enter U.S. soil. There were clear inconsistencies in the DHS and DHHS records regarding the identity of the relative to whom the assailant was released. Ultimately, DHS's, HHS's failures to, failures the MS-13 gang member as a minor to rent a room in a trailer park from another individual who was also an illegal immigrant. There was also a lack of transparency by DHS and DHHS, including but not limited to DHHS failure to provide House of Representative Chairman Jim Jordan a copy of its audit report. Let's take a moment and think about how Kayla felt that day, how scared she must have been that day knowing that she was dying if she was going to see her mommy again, her baby sister, her brother, or her cat Oreo. Kayla fought for her life that day with all that she had. And in the end, she lost to an individual that wasn't even supposed to be allowed in the country. For me, this is not a political issue. This is a safety issue for everyone living in the United States. This could have been anyone's daughter. I don't want any other parent to live the nightmare that I am living. I am her voice now, and I'm going to fight with everything I have to get her story told and bring awareness of the issue at the border. If we had stricter border policies, my daughter would still be alive today. Nothing will bring my daughter back nor fix the pain of not having her here. I don't want to prevent this from happening to someone else's child. This isn't about immigration. This is about protecting everyone in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nobles. Uh, I now recognize Mrs. Dunn for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. Good morning. Before I begin, I, uh, I wish to thank you all for the gift of your time. I want to thank you for allowing me to share my beautiful daughter's story. As painful as it is for me to do so, 
I wish to spare as many parents the unfathomable pain and debilitating grief that I carry every single day. My daughter Ashley has left this earth 967 days ago. Today would have been her 29th birthday. In the next five minutes, you will see many beautiful photos of Ashley on the screens. Photos are all that my family and I have left of her. That's not true. I guess we do have a small amount of ashes in an urn, and we do have our memories. In that same five minutes that I get to share her story after I traveled all the way from Arizona for Mr. Mayorkas not to appear here today, someone else's loved one in the United States will die in this same five minutes that I get to speak because of fentanyl. Over the next 24 hours, 190 loved ones in this country will die from fentanyl. 50% of that fentanyl is coming through my state with an open border. The beautiful state of Arizona today will lose five people to fentanyl, five. You see, Arizona recognizes that fentanyl is a weapon of mass destruction. While you see her beautiful smile and almond-shaped eyes scroll across those screens, more often than not, I remember her differently. Every time I close my eyes, I see all of the tubes. When it's quiet, I hear all of the machines that were keeping her alive. You see, my husband and I had to sit for 86 hours in the ICU while we were begging God, because yes, we're Christians and we're conservative, we're from Arizona, that she would just breathe. Over the last 32 months, Ashley did not celebrate her son's fifth, sixth, or seventh birthday. She did not watch her baby graduate from kindergarten. She did not celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving, nor did we as a family. I'm sure you guys did. So she celebrated the last of her birthdays when she was 26. She will forever be 26. Before you decide how you feel about my family and about fentanyl, understand that fentanyl affects all walks of life. By the time my testimony is over, please know that one person will have died. Ashley had brown hair and the most beautiful eyes. Ashley with one smile would steal your heart. Ashley had a kind heart and a gentle soul. I understand that the mission of the Department of Homeland Security is to secure our nation's air, land, and sea borders, to prevent illegal activity while facilitating lawful travel and trade. In my humble opinion, Mr. Mayorkas's border policy is partially responsible for my daughter's death. His wide open border policy allows massive quantities of poisonous fentanyl into our country. Arizona is the fentanyl superhighway into the United States. I personally feel Mr. Mayorkas is responsible for opening that border to allow more than 10 million illegal border crossings since February of 2021, which supports most of the illegal fentanyl into this country. This weapon of mass destruction has killed over 100,000 Americans on our soil for two years in a row. Under Secretary Mayorkas's leadership, or lack thereof, fentanyl is an invasion. The weapon of mass destruction has caused unimaginable numbers of deaths, unmeasurable damage to our country's family, families including my own. 
My family is broken. My heart is broken. And he couldn't even be here to face me today. Whatever he's doing that is more important than facing me today, I don't know what that could be. Our country deserves a secure border. Our country deserves to feel safe. Our country deserves to be free of fentanyl. We need to close the fentanyl superhighway. We need to close the border. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stein. I now recognize Ms. Pearlstein for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the committee's consideration of whether constitutional grounds exist to impeach Department of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. I've been a professor of constitutional law for more than a decade, a director of two different academic centers focused on the study of constitutional democracy. I've studied, written, and taught about the unique role impeachment plays in our system of government. As a mother and a former human rights lawyer, I couldn't take the subject matter in front of the committee today more seriously. My expertise, however, is in the field of constitutional law, not in immigration policy as such, and my testimony solely in my personal capacity is thus limited to questions of constitutional authority that are relevant here. While my written statement goes into greater detail, in these few minutes I'd like to highlight just two points. First, <clears throat> impeachment is a narrow remedy for a specific kind of misconduct limited by the Constitution to addressing offenses against our system of government that cannot be solved through ordinary channels of redress. Second, no branch of government has more power under our Constitution to address matters of border security than Congress. Although the framers of the US Constitution were convinced that impeachment would have to be retained from the British regime they had just overthrown as a remedy against the most egregious offenses of public officers, they were determined to limit the scope of the power to ensure it remained consistent with the new design of our constitutional democracy. Central to our system is this principle of separation of powers. Each branch of government remains independent, with none empowered to fully control the members of the others. Because impeachment was a potentially dangerous exception to that overriding principle, the framers significantly narrowed the scope of the impeachment power as it existed under the law of the king. Above all, the framers significantly narrowed the grounds for which officials could be impeached. And as now, treason and bribery were recognized as the most serious offenses against a system of government in which the American people were asked to entrust elected leaders uh, with acting in their interest. Treason was a betrayal of the interests of the American people in, the, in favor of the interests of a foreign enemy. Bribery involved a public official placing his own interests in personal power and enrichment above the interests of the public. By, lam by labeling the other category, other high crimes and misdemeanors, the framers signaled that they meant to include only those offenses that posed a similarly severe threat, not to a particular area of public policy, but to the very system of government that depends on officials acting in good faith on behalf of the people who place them in office. Policy differences could be addressed through elections. Impeachment was to be, and largely has been, a last ditch mechanism to address offenses against constitutional democracy by a single individual that can't be adequately addressed through ordinary channels of government. Second point, the first and most important remedy the Constitution provides to address perceived failings of the president and the executive branch remains the separation of powers, including Congress's authority to affect policy change itself. When it comes to immigration in particular, the Supreme Court has long described congressional power in the field as plenary. Article I of the Constitution grants Congress the power to set the terms and conditions by which a foreign national may become a U.S. citizen, sweeping authorities to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, the power to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying out these duties. And Article I, Section 9 gives Congress the exclusive power over how the U.S. government allocates its resources. These vast powers, which the Constitution sets out in its very first article, remain among our democracy's most fundamental checks on the exercise of executive power. Despite these vast reserves of constitutional authority, a spike in partisan polarization in recent decades, a refusal to work across partisan lines to solve common problems, has meant the power to address pressing national problems has gone unused. 
Nowhere has this effect been more apparent than in Congress's failure to develop national policy on immigration. Despite all that has changed, the last significant piece of comprehensive immigration legislation to pass Congress with bipartisan support was in 1986. The action under consideration here, impeachment, isn't a tool of policy change, particularly the impeachment of a single cabinet official who can be replaced by another official given precisely the same role will have no effect on the heartbreaking problems we have heard described. Without taking a position on the wisdom of any particular bill now under consideration, I understand that multiple pieces of bipartisan legislation are today pending in the House, very active negotiations underway in the Senate, the framers of the Constitution well understood the acute difficulty of embracing compromise with their domestic political opponents, but for the purpose of actually addressing the needs and easing the pain of the people who live in this country, the framers of the Constitution thought that no one in government could do more to make a real difference than you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perlstein. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Ms. Perlstein, uh, in 2019 on a New York Public Radio podcast, you were asked what you took away from a congressional hearing on impeachment standards. Your response was as follows. So this is an exchange that came out of and really belonged in the panel in which the constitutional law professors were appearing. Um, and there, the professors were reasonably uniform, right, in recognizing that it doesn't have to be a crime, that is to say an impeachable offense, doesn't have to be a crime as currently embodied in the federal criminal code um, as enacted by Congress. The existing criminal laws didn't exist when the framers wrote the Constitution. And and indeed, crimes as such weren't what the framers had in mind when they put impeachment into the Constitution. What they were thinking about with the impeachment remedy were serious offenses uh, against the public trust, that is, certain things that only the president and other senior officials could do that abused their authority. In other words, the idea of abuse of power is sort of the death do you still stand by those words? Yes, just a yes or no quick question. It is absolutely the case. The Congress doesn't have to show a violation of okay. Title 18 of the U.S. Code. It has to uh, show that there was a high crime or misdemeanor. Re re reclaiming my time, um, I think you're, the words that are very interesting to me is a serious offenses against the public trust. Ms. Nobles, Ms. Stein, do you think that our open border policies, which have allowed fentanyl to pour into this country, a million point eight gotaways, unknown gotaways, is an offense against the public trust of this country? Yes, definitely. I'm stunned. Yes. Ms. Nobles, the committee has been focused. Well, first, before I, I ask you your question, I. I one of the things that was very interesting in your opening statement, Ms. Polstein, was about the power of separation, the separation of powers. And you, and you talk about Congress having the remedy to make laws to fix the immigration issue and the border issue. But see, we passed a law that says, shall detain. Mr. Mayorkas has, in, has, subvert, has basically completely reversed that. So we could, you're right, we could pass more laws. In fact, we tried. We passed H.R. 2, but it won't pass the ha uh, Senate because they refuse to take it up. But yes, we have the power to pass more laws. They're not even following the laws that are already written. And that, from my standpoint, is basically a refusal to understand the separation of power, that we write the laws and they enforce them. But the secretary doesn't seem to care about that, nor does he seem to care about the four court orders, which have told him he's doing that and said cease and desist with these policies that are absolutely subverting the law, and he refused to follow those court orders. Ms. Nobles, the committee has been focused on the Biden administration's refusal to secure our southwest border and vet alien arrivals. A report from the House Judiciary Committee pointed out multiple betting failures with your daughter's killer. 
Its report shows that your daughter's murderer was arrested for association with the MS-13 well before he came to the United States, something the United States officials verif verified easily after the murder occurred. The report also noted that the alien was released after he was arrested for murder. Do you think that Secretary Mayorkas has done an adequate job of vetting illegal aliens coming across our southern border? No. And um, may I say that it took the local detectives to find out that he was an MS-13 gang member. Um, Homeland Security and in Department of Health and Human Services did not know that until after he killed my daughter. And then they try to write it in there after the fact, but it was already let out that they failed to know that he was an MS-13 gang member. Ms. Dunn, do you believe Secretary Mayorkas genuinely cares about the well-being and safety of U.S. citizens like your daughter, considering that his actions are directly responsible for aggravating and fueling the ongoing fentanyl crisis? Absolutely not. Thank you. I yield. I now recognize the ranking member for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say from the outset, every opportunity to provide resources for the Department of Homeland Security Democrats on this committee have always given them what they've asked. Uh, the majority of Republicans on this committee, they've not given them resources. So when we interview people in the department, the number one issue that comes up is we need more resources, technology, sometimes manpower, sometimes just the ability to interdict and that is what we try to provide on a regular basis. And I encourage my colleagues that when the next opportunity come to fund the department, let's listen to the men and women who work in the department who say they need the resources and let's give it to them. Uh, Professor Pearlstein, last week, you joined two dozen of the country's most knowledgeable constitutional lawyers on a bipartisan letter to Speaker Johnson and Chairman Green explaining that the Republican case against Secretary Mayorkas is unjustified as a matter of constitutional law. Can you explain in simple terms why you and your colleagues concluded that impeaching the Secretary is unjustified under the Constitution? Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Yes. Um, the term high crimes and misdemeanors, which is what's at issue here, is a limited term of art. It includes only those offenses against the system of government, not ordinary crimes, offenses against the structure of government comparable to treason and bribery, offenses that interfere in the way the government works. The allegations that have been set forth here, uh, which are very serious, are profound complaints about the policies that the current secretary has pursued. They're policies that the secretary has pursued under the pr current president of the United States who appointed the secretary and was elected to pursue those policies. Policy differences, and I agree with my colleague at the last hearing, no matter how profound are exactly not what impeachment was meant to be for. The framers were very worried that impeachment would become something like a tool of the parliamentary system so that Congress could, in essence, hold the president and the president's administration on a leash. The framers wanted each branch to remain independent to make their own policy judgments so that their ambition could counteract ambition and they would fight each other on democratic terms over what the right answer was. Thank you very much. Uh, I also want to talk to you about uh, how Republicans and Democrats on this committee can work together to strengthen board, border security and address the opioid crisis. Democrats agree about the need for action to help families like those on our panel today and prevent further tragedies. Uh, Professor, in your testimony, you say, and I quote, the first and most important remedy the Constitution provides to address perceived failings of the president and executive branch remains the separation of powers, including Congress's constitutional authority to affect policy change itself. In other words, if the Congress doesn't like what an administration is doing, 
The Constitution gives its power to pass laws to direct a different course of action. Can you explain the power Congress has under the Constitution to expect change? Thank you. Congress has uh, the most power of any branch in the government to affect change. It has, under Article I, the exclusive power to spend any money and allocate resources on behalf of the United States. Uh, it also has the other powers that I listed in my opening remarks. Um, and critically, while it does have the power to pass laws, sweeping laws, uh, and has, it is also subject to the rule of the Supreme Court, which has in the allegations at issue here, twice rejected the arguments that were noted by the chairman moments ago uh, that in fact there was a violation of law here. Those laws remain on the books uh, and Congress can do additional things, principally through funding but not exclusively, to make them even stronger. Thank you, I yield back. <clears throat> The gentleman yields. I now recognize the chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, House Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this uh, powerful hearing. I uh, was a federal prosecutor. I was deputy attorney general for the state of Texas for criminal justice. I worked with the victims of crime. That's what we do. And we talk a lot about facts and figures about the border you know, statistics, but your stories are the most powerful because they're real life stories about the impact of this man's violation of the public trust. And I do, I just, I, I agree with your podcast that it doesn't have to be a federal statute because they didn't have a lot of federal statutes when the founding fathers were at the Constitutional Convention. In fact, the Supreme Court recently held that impeachment is a tool Congress can use to hold this secretary accountable. It's the legal justification. I believe he's violated his oath. He's violated the public trust. He's violated your daughters. I intend to personally uphold my oath to my country that I took in office. It's been a dereliction of duty of the grossest proportions I've seen in my 25 years of dealing with this border. Ms. Dunn, I, uh, I couldn't agree. With fentanyl is a weapon of mass destruction. I passed a bill out of my committee defining it as such. It comes from China, and they make it in Mexico, and they kill our children here, 200,000, more than Vietnam, World War II. My children have been to six funerals now. I've seen it personally. The destruction it does every five minutes. It is a fentanyl superhighway. And this border policy is personally responsible for it. He took an oath to defend and protect the Constitution and the American people, air, land, and sea, from enemies, foreign and domestic. Ms. Dunn, do you believe he violated that oath? Yes, sir. I flew from Arizona to meet him and face him and ask him why. And he's not here today. I did not know that until after I landed yesterday. And he doesn't have the decency no. to even show up. That is correct. And talk to you personally. Today is my daughter's birthday. I would have much rather been home with my poor husband grieving her. I didn't need to be here today. So whatever he's doing, I hope it's more important than that. Well, let me say I'm sorry. Thank you. Because apparently the secretary doesn't care to show up and say that to you. No. Do you know he's meeting with Mexican officials today? Exactly. How does that make you feel? Oh, you have no idea how I feel. I'll be meeting with Mexican officials later next week, and I'm going to have a different story for them. I'm going to have your story Thank that you. I will take to them. Ms. Nobles, God, you know, these, these gang bangers come in and they join trafficking organizations that are being sent to families that don't exist because it's a trafficking organization in the United States. This man, this one man who deserves impeachment has created a criminal enterprise in the United States of America. 
eight million encounters. What are we gonna do with all these millions of people with no legal status who can't get a real job? So what do they do? It's drugs, gang banging, murder. Now, I've seen it in my career and they're the worst. And it sickens me what happened to your daughter and you must relive it in your head every single day what she went through, what your poor daughter had to experience that day. Do you hold Mr. Mayorkas personally accountable for the death of your daughter? Yes, I do. I do too. And that's why he needs to be impeached. Do you hold him personally accountable for what he did? Do you hold him personally accountable for the policies he established which violated the public trust and ended up in the death of your daughter? Yes. And yet he doesn't have the decency or the guts to show up to you today and say, I'm sorry, did he? No, he did not. I mean, she was killed three days after her 20th birthday. She spent three days being 20. And I sent her a message on her birthday on July 24th that I was proud of the woman that she was becoming and that I love her. And I didn't know that would be my last message to tell her that I love her. She even bought herself, I even got, I gave her the money to buy her a um, JoJo Suya cake because that is who she loved. And she had autism and she loved JoJo. And her life was brutally taken and she had no idea what to expect that day when she went to bed after getting off the night shift of work and went to sleep in her own bed and had no idea what was going to happen on July 27th. Let me just close by saying I have a daughter that is your daughter's age. She has a cat named Snickers. I know your daughter had a cat named Oreo. Um, this is the personal side of this chaos created by this man. This is a personal life story of the cause and effect that has happened because of these failed policies on the border. It's destruction and it's death and it has to stop. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize uh, the gentlelady from uh, Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for her five minutes of test, uh, questioning. As a mother, I would like to begin by offering my sincere condolences uh, to Ms. Dunn and Ms. Nobles for the devastating losses that they and their families have experienced. No amount of sympathy and thank yous can compensate for the loss. No one should ever have to experience the loss of a child. So please know that we are committed to making our community safer and combating the heinousness of drug trafficking and other violence that comes for those that should not be in this country um, and should not take advantage of the innocent people who are here, which includes your children. Mr. Chairman, the stories of Ms. Dunn and Ms. Nobles are gut-wrenching. They are clearly, for any of us, we cannot stand in their shoes no matter how much we try to empathize, try to seem like we are standing in their shoes, try to use language that would create hysteria to seem like we have the same pain. Nobody, no one can express the pain that a parent that has lost a child can feel. It is gut-wrenching. But you brought them here, unfortunately, where our solutions may not be the solutions that they seek. Under the false pretense that impeaching Secretary Mayorkas would be in any way prevent what happened to their children from happening to someone else's. It wouldn't, and I think you know that. What is worse is that the Republicans on this committee are not leveling with Americans about the actions that they have taken or not taken to secure the border and combat drug trafficking. The truth is, at every opportunity, Republicans at the federal and state level have pursued policies, politics over policy, and obstructed efforts to improve conditions at the border. We need more resources. We need more skilled personnel. We need more ways to keep bad guys out of here, 
to ensure the protection of the innocent, precious children of these two mothers. In Washington, all but nine of my Republican colleagues voted against the FY 2023 omnibus, which provided much needed increases on Customs Border Protection funding to increase personnel along the border and improve fentanyl detection. Republicans have refused to act on the president's supplement request, sitting right here, waiting for us to act, which would provide additional resources, not only for CBP, but also for communities receiving migrants. And instead of considering politics, policies to improve security along the border or prevent drug trafficking and treat fentanyl addiction, we are willing or sitting here today at a futile impeachment proceeding. We need to give hope to these parents. We need to give love that shows action. So let me quickly ask Professor Pearlstein, Republicans have argued that the secretary should be impeached for failing to secure the border, yet most of them have voted against funding for border security that the administration requested. If Republicans really wanted to secure the border, is it more effective to provide the funding that the administration has requested or to impeach the secretary? Let me add this question as well, uh, if you can incorporate both of these. As I noted, the governor of Texas has blocked Border Patrol from entering areas along the U.S.-Mexico border. If Republicans really wanted Border Patrol to improve enforcement along the southwest border, does it make sense to exclude Border Patrol from areas surrounding the border? In fact, we lost a mother and two children just recently. Do you believe a state can do that under the Constitution? Thank you, Doctor. This question is, is for you. Thank you, Representative Jackson Lee. Uh, I can't speak to policy effectiveness. It is certainly within Congress's power today in the Republican side as well as the Democratic side to vote appropriations that would actually support programs for fentanyl addiction and programs that would support families who've lost loved ones to, uh, to any of these. Um, I can't speak to the details of what's happening on the border today, but the general rule of the Constitution is federal law under the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Uh, state efforts to interfere with federal efforts to, inter to enforce border laws are unconstitutional. Let me just quickly say, Mr. Chairman, this impeachment proceeding um, is not going where we want it to go. We want to help these parents. We want to cry out for them, but we want to give them solutions. We want to focus on a border security mission with the resources that Congress has afforded the department and within the confines of the law. My Republican colleagues would rather deprive DHS of the reasonableness and resources it needs to carry out its border security mission so that it can attack the secretary, who himself I've seen show great remorse for the losses of individuals. Impeaching him, is that the answer to saving our children? I would hope that we would come together, stand together, to be outraged over the loss of anyone's precious, precious child and stand united as the American people to fight against this dastardly act of drugs and viciousness at the border and make our borders safe for Americans and as well as those who come to this country for the right reasons. All of them are our neighbors who live in the southern uh, part of the United States. They are our neighbors and we should try to find a way, but we should not ignore the pain of these parents. We can do both, and we do not have to make a mockery of impeachment. We can work with the Department of Homeland Security and our Secretary of Homeland Security and this president who cares. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, Chairman, I yield. The back. gentlelady yields. I now recognize Mr. Higgins for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our southern border, under the control of Secretary Mayorkas, is 1,954 miles of failure. 10 million illegal crossings in three years. The disintegration of American sovereignty, the total loss of American law and order, exponential enhancement of cartel human trafficking operations and cartel narcotics trafficking. Millions of American families crushed 
by financial loss and the unspeakable grief of unprecedented loss of American lives to drugs and violent crime. This is the legacy of Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. And as God is my witness, we will impeach that man in this committee. We will hold him accountable for his colossal failure. And we will take no pleasure in doing so because it closes the, the, the chapter of a disastrous era of American history. We've largely lost our country down there. This body should be discussing sending massive military aid to Texas, not to Ukraine. Ms. Nobles, Mrs. Dunn, I lost a daughter long ago. It's a club nobody wants to join. Now listen. It was difficult to listen to your testimony, and I read your submitted testimony. And the message that I received is that your daughters are perfected, and they are very, very proud of you both. I promise you, we will hold Secretary Mayorkas accountable and further the administration that he serves. Ms. Nobles, I'm going to ask you to reflect upon a particular policy that, our, that the Biden administration and Secretary Mayorkas pursues. The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services have systems in place to, quote, unquote, ensure that unaccompanied alien children from non-contiguous countries are transferred from Customs and Border Protection to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR. But the House Judiciary Report regarding your daughter's murder notes that the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, had lost track of more than 85,000 children and placed fewer than 15,000 follow-up calls, calls, not personal visits, after discharging an additional 32,000 children. Now, at no point did anyone under Secretary Mayorkas' command flag the, the violent criminal that murdered your daughter. No. Had a criminal gang history, along with multiple MS-13 tattoos. What would your daughter say? about a Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security who facilitates a system that has lost over 100,000 children, mostly young teenage girls. Mrs. Nobles. Sorry, what was your question? What would your daughter say about over 100,000 lost teenage children of God? A system run like that. She would be very, I'm sure she'd be very upset. Her heart would break for those children, would they not? Yes. Americans just like her require action. And that's what this committee will deliver. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, let me uh, thank our witnesses for being here today, Ms. Dunn, Ms. Nobles. I'm also a father, like many of us here, represent an area, a lot of hard work in Americans, surviving day to day. My four kids were growing up. We invested a lot of time and effort, Little League, Little League basketball, keeping them away from that bad stuff. 
Remember story. My fellow father, another father in Little League, his kid was a gifted athlete. He was going to be the next major league player. His dad was there every day pitching to him bucket after bucket of baseballs. Then one day, they stopped showing up. Later on, I found out that that young man and his dad started going to drug rehab. That son had come under the spill of hard drugs, and I've never seen him again. Stories like yours, I wish I could say were not, were uncommon in my district, but I've heard them way too many times. Each one that I hear, your story is a pain and suffering. In my district, we lived through heroin addicts, the cocaine surge, crack, PCP, and now fentanyl, the worst of all. This is the reason why all of us here, the federal level, Democrats, Republicans, on both houses with the president have to stop bickering, have to stop fighting, come together to protect middle America in this country, ma'am. When it comes to fentanyl, you said Arizona 50%. I'll tell you, I've been to the border. I've talked to our CBP officers. They tell me 65% of all the fentanyl crosses through the San Isidro port of entry, just one port. It goes north through my county, and that's why we have so many problems in our area. You have one set of numbers. CBP has another set of numbers, but it is a challenge that we have to address. CBP, in 2019, we had 20, seizure of 2,800 pounds. 2019, we had over 27,000 pounds of CBP seized. 800% increase. But based on those border officers, this is about 10% of what's coming through. This is about 10%, 90% probably still gets through. And I've asked those border officers, what do you need to do your job better? You know what they've told me? We need more resources. We need more personnel. When those officers tell me I'm working 16 hour shifts, we need more personnel, we have to respond with more resources. It's not Lou. It's the men and women at the border telling us what they need. So, Professor Perlstein, dereliction of duty is not an impeachable offense, correct? The amount of, correct? The amount of seizures at the border, I would say, shows that somebody's doing their job there. It's just a lot. What's better for us to do? Fight over an impeachment or respond to President Biden ask for additional resources at the border, in your opinion? The impeachment will have no impact on resources available to the border. It will have no impact on the policies pursued by this administration at all. Funding change, the appropriation of money for additional officers, for example, to um, improve fentanyl seizure operations uh, based on what you've described certainly might have any effect and indeed may be a good effect. Impeachment has none. And I've just asked my colleagues here today, let's get it together, surge resources to the border, make sure we stop fentanyl from crossing into our country. Every day that we debate over funding levels is another day that more Americans die from fentanyl. The chairman, thank you, and I yield. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Guest, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to rebut a little bit the argument that's been made by my colleagues on the other side that Republicans aren't willing to uh, secure resources for the border. Uh, and I'll just tell you that that is a complete, absolute misstatement of fact. 
In September, the House of Representatives passed an appropriations package for the Department of Homeland Security that appropriated an additional $2 billion. Those funds would go to hire additional agents. Those funds would go to merit pay. Those funds would go to invest in additional technology to stop the flow of fentanyl coming into this country. We also passed H.R. 2, which would have done the exact same thing. And so for my colleagues on the other aisle to say we should be more focused on funding DHS and what we're doing here today, I would argue that we have done that. We passed our appropriations bill, we sent it to the Senate, and Chuck Schumer has let that bill sit there, gathering dust, refusing to bring either H.R. 2 or the House appropriations bill to the Senate for a vote. And so for them to say that is a complete and utter misstatement of the facts. Uh, Professor Perlstein, uh, I do agree with you uh, in your statement uh, where you said that we do not have to have a violation of the Federal Criminal Code for impeachment, uh, and agree with you when you say serious offenses against public trust would arise to the level of impeachment. Uh, prior to being elected to Congress, I served as a prosecutor in my local community, uh, tried many jury trials. I remember often hearing the judges tell potential jurors that reasonable, good-minded people can reach different conclusions when applying facts to the law. The law in this case, I believe, is the Constitution, the impeachment clause, uh, that we as reasonable members of Congress must apply the facts. And the facts as I view them and they may be different than viewed by other members of Congress. Everyone views those uh, in, in using their own perspective. Uh, I believe that there is, is ample evidence. I believe that Secretary Mayorkas violated his oath to protect and defend the Constitution. I believe that Secretary Mayorkas has willfully failed to enforce the law, particularly the INA, where it says repeatedly that the Secretary shall detain and remove immigrants. I believe that Secretary Mayorkas has lied to Congress when he has repeatedly come in and said that the border is secure. I'll tell you an example. Just last year, in April of last year, as Secretary Mayorkas came and he sat there uh, where you were sitting, Ms. Dunn, I had the opportunity to ask him, are all nine sectors of the southwest border secure? And his answer was yes. Now his answer contradicted the answer given just three weeks prior by his Chief of Border Patrol, Chief Ortiz, when Chief Ortiz said five of the nine sectors on our southwest border are not secure. So I believe he's violated his oath to protect and defend the Constitution. I believe that he has willfully failed to enforce the law, and I believe that he has lied to Congress. Now, Professor, I see in your statement that you provided, you say that really only on two occasions back in 1904 and, excuse me, 1804 and 1872, where you had the removal of two U.S. district judges uh, where they were removed, one because one was chronically inebriated and the other was mentally incapacitated. Uh, and you said that they were unable to carry out their duties because of that. Uh, I believe that a person who willfully chooses not to carry out their duties is more impeachable than someone who has some sort of mental, mental inability to do so. And I believe that the record is clear if you look at what this committee has done to show that Secretary Mayorkas has refused to carry those duties out. Now, I want to ask you, because you clearly say in your report, Professor, uh, that you've given that Congress, uh, that there appears to be no constitutional basis for um, pursuing this impeachment. Uh, my question is relating to a different impeachment matter. Did you feel that way last Congress for the two impeachments of President Trump? Did you feel that there was a constitutional basis for the impeachment of Donald Trump, either his first or second impeachment? I did. Okay, and so this matter differs uh, in Secretary Mayorkas from both the first and second impeachment of the former president. Yes. And in what manner? Several. Uh, first, although I've heard now several times the allegation here that Secretary Mayorkas was in some respect violating his legal responsibility, 
those claims, the specific claims you've raised about detention, enforcement power, were raised and litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court by the state of Texas. Ms. Burr, let, let me ask, um, can, can, reasonable people, can, reasonable people, can reasonable people look at the facts and draw different conclusions? Reasonable people can't draw different conclusions about the law as applied here. I, I, you have to the apply Supreme the law to the facts. I understand, and I don't believe that there is consensus that, that your Kavanaugh. version of what you believe the law is uh, is actually time is not. I, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman from uh, Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee is recognized for the purpose of entering something into the record. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'll ask unanimous consent to submit into the record um, a article, uh, Why America is Struggling to Stop the Fentanyl Epidemic, uh, and uh, an article uh, that says how fentanyl crisis fourth wave has hit every corner of the United States. I ask unanimous consent to place those in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Carter, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Before I begin, I want to first personally thank uh, these brave witnesses for being here. Our heart goes out to you and your families for your incredible loss. Um, we all recognize the significance and the importance of this, this matter. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that our chairman, as we speak, is in the hallway doing an interview with Fox News instead of listening to the testimony of these uh, heartbroken parents. I think that demonstrates just where we should be. We should be here, not talking to talking heads and feeding into that. Um, you know, my colleagues have spent the past year blaming Secretary Mayorkas for longstanding issues like immigration, drug addiction, crime, and so forth. However, impeachment over differences in policy is not constitutional. It also solves exactly nothing for the problems that we were sent here to Congress to solve. It's high time that we, as members of Congress, must come together to pass laws that combat fentanyl in our communities and fund drug treatment programs to help save lives, not to determine who has the biggest megaphone or the biggest political voice to exact vengeance. Our job is to serve and to come up with solutions together Republican and Democrat, to solve our nation's problems. Professor Perlstein, would impeaching Secretary Marcus over policy differences between the Biden administration and House Republicans solve any problems facing our country? I don't believe it would. The president retains the exclusive constitutional power to replace Secretary Mayorkas with another official who he would charge with pursuing exactly the same policies here. Is it a bit disingenuous to suggest that somehow this is new? The issues that we're facing are new at the border and somehow that uh, it was perfect before Secretary Mayorkas took over. Um, my knowledge, just based on Supreme Court cases, of the number of cases that have arisen surrounding executive actions over border policies and reading the history there suggests that these problems have existed through five administrations over decades, largely because Congress has enacted contradictory laws that are impossible to comply with and multiple administrations have struggled to resolve that contradiction. Many of the Republicans complain that the Biden administration and Secretary Mayorkas are not doing enough on immigration border security, fentanyl, or crime. Professor Pearlstein, does Congress have any role in resolving these longstanding issues? If so, please explain. Thank you, uh, Representative. As I've mentioned before, Congress has a central role. Um, indeed, the Supreme Court has repeatedly held in cases going back more than a century that Congress's power in this area is plenary, meaning absolute. Um, that is not to say that the executive doesn't retain under his own Article II authority enforcement power, but Congress can not only appropriate funds, it can impose conditions on funds, and in the opinion folks are so fond of citing in the recent Supreme Court cases, uh, while impeachment is certainly uh, one power that Congress has, uh, oversight, appropriations, the legislative process, Senate confirmations, uh, withholding funds, and of course, centrally, elections, 
um, are all tools that are available uh, to Congress and to the American people to affect change here. And are withholding funds because you are unhappy with the secretary in any way helpful to the issues that these two grieving mothers have faced and others may continue to face? I can't imagine that it is. I've got a, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this into the record. Synthetic opioid overdose deaths soared while Trump was president. Not my words. This report, March 2nd, 2023. Without objection. Be be between 2019 and 2020, the last year of Trump's presidency, the increase in drug overdose deaths from synthetic opioid was at 55%. Between 20 and 21, the first year of Joe Biden's presidency, the increase in drug overdose deaths from synthetic opioid was at 25%. Not my words. I'll enter this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I will tell you this. This is nothing to be proud of that one president had higher than another, but it is a fact that requires discussion but it isn't anything to be proud of because if it were just 1%, if it was just one daughter, one son, one child that was impacted by this horrible drug that's in our communities now, that comes across our borders now, not necessarily by immigrants, but primarily by those that are seeking to do harm and to enter the drug trade. What do we do when we strip off our party veils and say, let's fix this issue, regardless of our party? Let's take away the notion that this one man, Secretary Marcus, is this boogeyman, and we send the message to the rest of the world, if we can just get rid of him, all of our problems, would go away. It isn't fair, it's disingenuous, it's misleading to the American people. They deserve better and we can do better. Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hamina, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. And um, Ms. Perlstein, uh, do you believe that dereliction of duty is an, uh, is an impeachable offense? The only uh, examples in U.S. history I cited in my testimony, the words dereliction with, of duty weren't charged, they weren't the articles of impeachment, but those circumstances were where judges, the officers in, at issue, uh, were either chronically drunk or mentally incapable of performing their duties or both. Do you believe that failure to uphold your oath to protect the homeland, is that an impeachable offense? I don't believe that anybody has ever been impeached for a failure I've never, to I didn't ask the oath. question. I said, do you believe that somebody who fails to uphold their oath to protect the homeland, is that an impeachable offense? I believe that somebody who acts in his own interests or the interests of gaining his own power or in the interests of a foreign power is impeachable. So you don't think that somebody who fails, who, who fails to uphold the oath to protect the homeland and does it in a way that's a dereliction of duty, you don't believe that that's impeachable? That somehow Congress doesn't have the right to exercise its power of impeachment to remove that individual who is clearly violating his oath and is dereliction in his duty? You don't think that Congress can do that? I don't know that there's evidence here of dereliction of I duty. I didn't say if there's evidence. The I'm not asking oath, evidence. Ma'am, 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 I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time. I'd like for you to answer my question, not your question. Okay, my question is very specific. I didn't say about this case. I'm just talking in general, all right? In okay. general, depending on the circumstances, depending on the violation of the Constitution, it's conceivable, yes. Okay, so if we determine that, that Mr. Mayorkas is derelict in his duty and has failed to uphold his oath to protect the homeland, in our opinion, okay, then is that an impeachable offense? Again, dereliction of duty is different from failure to comply with the oath, right? To the extent the oath I said both. a variety of I things. I said both, so. Well, they're two different legal arguments. Well, so I said me. both. 
Okay. So I've addressed the you question. Can be, can't you be guilty of having two, doing two things at the I've, same time? I've addressed the impeachability of dereliction of duty. Okay. Very the question good. of the oath is something separate. To the extent it raises an allegation of a violation of the Constitution, it is potentially impeachable. But here, the Supreme Court has rejected that argument. I don't believe they have. But anyway, I'll, I'll move on. Is, um, is a violation of law. Is that when, when a, an individual clearly violates the law, um, is that impeachable offense? Depending on the law, I guess, right? I mean, how, how serious that law is, is that your interpretation? Impeachment, right, is only about a certain category of offenses. It only addresses a certain category of offenses. It has to be an offense similar to treason or bribery, that is, an offense against the system of government not any ordinary criminal offense, something that disrupts the structure of the Constitution or our system of government. Very good. Okay, thank you. So um, allowing millions and millions of people to come into the United States, uh, violating uh, the clear intent of Congress when it says that in order to be paroled in the United States, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and you, you do it on a mass basis. That may, actually may have something you know, to affect, may affect uh, the land. It may affect the, uh, the structure of government. Um, I would argue that. And so I guess it's up to the Supreme Court to, de to determine that e eventually. Now, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Dunn, uh, let me say that, that you know, I feel deeply for, for you and your loss. Actually, in my extended family, we had the same kind of loss uh, due to fentanyl. Um, do you believe that, uh, that the multinational criminal organizations, the cartels um, that are working across the border, do you believe that they are a terrorist organizations, for lack of a better word? Yes, sir, I do. And they're guilty of mass murder? Yes, sir, I do believe that. And I, and I do, too. And, um, and I believe also one of the things in, that, that Mr. Mayorkas has shown to be derelict in his duty is the absolute failure of this administration to combat what I consider to be a multi, be terrorist organizations, which are the, the Mexican uh, drug, uh, drug cartels that control the border. And by the way, I also believe the Biden administration is actually helping those uh, organizations uh, by not stemming the flow of illegal immigration. Uh, they are enriching those multinational organizations to the tune of, tune of billions of dollars, which allows them to produce more fentanyl, which allows them to kill tens of thousands of American citizens. And so for that, too, I believe that Mr. Mallorca has, has uh, failed miserably in his duty to protect the, uh, the homeland. And with that, my time has expired, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields. Mr. Thanador is recognized for five minutes for question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses here today. My sincere condolences to our witnesses. As a father and a grandfather, I sympathize with your unimaginable loss. As a member of Congress, I realize it is my duty and my colleagues' duty to do all we can to prevent tragedies like this from impacting our communities. That is why one of my first acts as a freshman member of Congress was introducing an amendment to the Republicans' HR2 border bill which they are now threatening to shut the government down over, which aimed to bolster the Department of Homeland Security's efforts to combat cross-border threats posed by transnational criminal organizations. This amendment, which would have strengthened DHS's ability to combat organizations engaging in criminal activity such as uh, drug trafficking and human smuggling, was voted down by every single Republican member. Citing in this hearing room today, sitting in this hearing room today and on this committee. 
while Republicans voted this and every other democratic amendment down, I know enacting meaningful legislation is needed to address the issues at the southern border. That's why I have introduced the United Against Transnational Criminal Organizations Act. Several of my Democratic colleagues on this committee have signed on to this bill, which directs DSS to take a range of actions to combat illicit criminal cartel activity that undermines our homeland security. The bill directs DHS to establish a joint task force bringing together multiple agency components to conduct operations to combat cross-border threats posed by TCOs and organizations engaged in the trafficking of fentanyl and its materials across the land border of US. This bill directs DHS to establish an integrated border intelligence analytical cell to improve information sharing regarding the concentrated surge of migration, smuggling, and trafficking. And since we know a vast amount of fentanyl is trafficked through our ports of entry, it requires DHS to issue a strategy to improve the effectiveness of the screening of vehicles, persons, and cargo at land ports of entry that are at high risk of being related to transnational criminal organizations. My question to you, Professor Polston, would you agree that a legislation such as my United Against Transnational Criminal Organizations Act is a more effective measure to solving the issues at our border versus uh, impeaching a secretary over policy differences? Thank you, uh, Mr. Tanadar. Again, I'm not an immigration policy expert, but the bill that you propose is certainly within Congress's power to enact. Uh, it may have an effect on immigration policy. Impeachment will have no effect on immigration policy. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pfluger, is recognized for five minutes for questions. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Nobles and Ms. Dunn, I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, we, we can't even fathom the loss that you've gone through. And your courage to be here to speak out, to bring light to the situation, to speak the truth, is not only commended, but it's necessary so that we avoid this pain for other families. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, Professor Perlstein, are you familiar with the William Belknap case that you mentioned in your testimony? Are you very, like, you're intimately familiar with it as a constitutional law expert? I'm generally familiar with the Belknap impeachment, yes. You, you wrote about it in your testimony, correct? I did, yes. Is there a reason that you left out the fact that Article three of that impeachment case mentioned the disregarding of his duty as Secretary of War? N no. Was it particularly helpful to your argument today? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Was there a reason you left that out? I wasn't giving a full book report on the Belknap yeah. impeachment. Okay. I was mentioning it in my testimony. Oh, that's fine. Um, As the only other me, instance in U.S. history in which Congress has ever right in Article it Three of that, they, they, thank you. That's the only other history. What, what we're talking officer. about is unprecedented disregarding of his duty. I'm going to quote you. There, the professors were reasonably uniform in recognizing that it doesn't have to be a crime. That is to say, an impeachable offense doesn't have to be a crime as currently embodied in the federal criminal code as enacted by Congress. What they were thinking about with the impeachment remedy were serious offenses against the public trust. That is certain things that only the president and other senior officials could do that abuse their authority. Did you in fact say this with regards to the Trump impeachment? I've, I've said many things about impeachment. I don't, I, yeah. it's entirely possible that I said that and I, I would still agree okay. with it actually. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert for the record 
uh, Professor Perlstein's comments on a radio show in New York on a podcast in 2019 regarding the Trump administration's... Uh, Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, so do you believe, will you define impeachment um, with regards to the public trust, as you said it there, with regards to Trump? If the public trust is broken, is that an impeachable offense? Public trust in this context refers to two kinds of breaches of the public trust generally. One is a official who is acting in his own personal interest, right, to aggrandize his own political wealth interests, power, et cetera, as opposed to the interests of the American people. That's an example of a breach of the public trust. The other is if an official is acting on behalf of a foreign power, which is another example of a breach of a public trust. Mm. Yes. And I thought those you, issues were both implicated in the Trump-Ukraine impeachment. Do you believe that public trust has been broken with regards to the common defense of our country? As a general matter, the, collect, the collective defense of our country. As a general matter, I'm not. I'm not sure I can answer that question that broadly stated. Has the public? I'm not aware of any evidence. For example, the Secretary Mayorkas has been acting for his own personal wealth okay. or aggrandizement. That, that's fine. But in general, is breaking the public trust in an egregious manner grounds for an impeachment proceeding? In the way I just defined breaking the public trust, that is, acting on behalf of one's own interests as opposed to the interests of the public, yes, that can be an impeachable ground if what, there is evidence of that. Are, are you uh, licensed in a state? Am I a member of the bar, do oh, you mean? The bar, yeah. Yes, I'm a member of the bar of the state of California, and I'm a member of the bar of Washington, D.C. Is it your responsibility to uphold the laws in those states in which you are a member of the bar? I have all of the same ethical obligations that any attorney has. When you take the oath of office as a cabinet member to well and faithfully execute the duties of the office, does that infer a responsibility to uphold the laws as well? Anybody who takes an oath to take care that the laws are faithfully executed has an oath to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, mm -hmm. yes. Did you condemn the attacks uh, by Hamas on Israel? I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. It's a question. Did you condemn the attacks? My personal view of those attacks is that they were abhorrent. I don't think I've had occasion to speak about it publicly. It's not my area of expertise. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize Mr. Magaziner, for, for the gentleman from Rhode Island, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses for having the courage to share their stories and their expertise today. We have real challenges at the border. I've been there, I've seen it, and I know that the American people are counting on Congress to act. Unfortunately, too many of my Republican colleagues are more focused on playing politics instead of working together to address our problems. The Biden administration has requested $14 billion to secure the border, funding that would hire more than 1,300 Border Patrol agents, and more than 1,000 CBP officers. House Republicans have refused to call a vote on this funding for nearly four months. They have sat on this proposal for nearly four months, undercutting their claim that they really care about border security. If you care about it, call a vote. And if you don't like all of the proposal, call a vote on the parts that you do like. When House Republicans were asked why they won't call a vote on the president's border funding request, one of them said, quote, let me tell you, I'm not willing to do too damn much right now to help a Democrat and to help Joe Biden's approval rating. That tells you all you need to know. He was more concerned about Joe Biden's approval rating than about fixing the problems at the border. And he's not the only one. Laura Ingram on Fox News said that Republicans should not accept any border deal because it would be, quote, a victory for Biden. Even Speaker Johnson has openly mused that House Republicans will not accept more border funding until there is a Republican president. Now, some of my colleagues say, well, funding's not enough. We need policy changes at the border, too. Okay. Over the last month, through the holidays, Secretary Mayorkas has been working diligently with Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats to try to come up with a policy plan for the border. 
Where have House Republicans been in those talks? MIA, not participating. They gave themselves a vacation for a month. Well, imagine, imagine if the reverse were the truth. Imagine if House Republicans were actually working with the Senate on a border plan and Secretary Mayorkas decided to go on vacation for a month. What would people say about that? Instead, you know, this phrase, dereliction of duty, gets thrown around a lot. It is my House Republican colleagues who have been derelict in their duty. They have refused to call a vote on border funding for four months. They have refused to participate in the talks with the Secretary and the Senate to put a border plan together. What have they been doing instead? Playing politics. They passed a budget plan, the so-called Limit Save Grow Act, which would have cut the Department of Homeland Security by 22%, eliminating 2,000 CBP officers at the border. Every one of them voted for that. When the Biden administration requested $84 million to help states and cities with the costs associated with migration, House Republicans instead cut it to zero. Some House Republicans have openly called for shutting down the government this week, even though they know that that means that Border Patrol agents who are already overworked and underpaid would be forced to work without any pay at all. And now they are playing politics with impeachment, even though there is no legal basis for impeaching the secretary. I've heard that this is going to be our final impeachment hearing. And still, House Republicans have yet to clearly articulate what laws they think the secretary has broken. They have not brought in a single legal expert who is willing to put up their hand and under oath state that there is a sound legal basis for impeachment. The best they could do last week was a handful of Republican politicians. They invited the secretary to appear in a hearing to defend himself against their ambiguous charges. And then when he sent a letter back on January 11th saying that he would appear, they reneged on his invitation and disinvited him. But the sad thing about these political games is that this is wasted time. This is time that we could be spending to work together on real solutions for the border, real solutions to solve the fentanyl crisis, real solutions to combat the cartels and create a safe and orderly system at the border. Senate Democrats are working on it as we speak. Senate Republicans are working on it as we speak. The Secretary is working on it as we speak. And it is only House Republicans who are putting politics ahead of doing the work to solve our problems. Professor, for those of us who are serious about trying to improve the situation at the border, is impeachment Congress's most effective tool to do it, or are there other powers that Congress has that would be better suited to fixing the situation at the border? Thank you, Congressman. As I've said, impeachment in this context will have no effect on administration or American border policy. Congress has a host of tools at its disposal, as the Supreme Court recently listed, and I've, as, as I've testified to, including, of course, appropriations, oversight hearings, the legislative process, Senate confirmations, withholding funds, and then, of course, as, I, as I've mentioned before, elections. There are others as well. Thank you, Professor. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break to give our witnesses an opportunity to uh, take a break. And we will reconvene at, uh, we'll, we'll say, 1140. The committee is adjourned, or is uh, in recess.
get uh, get seated and get going there and be great uh, members who are tying up our witnesses. The committee will come to order. I now recognize uh, the gentlelady from Georgia, Mrs. Green, for her five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so far today on this, this very important historic hearing, we've listened to Democrats complain that Republicans have, ha have done nothing to stop the border security crisis, pretending that we didn't pass HR2, the strongest border bill that has ever been passed in Congress. All of our Democrat colleagues voted no to that bill. My Democrat colleagues today are complaining that they need more money. Well, it seems to be from listening on, these, on this committee most of the time, they want more money to help more migrants come into the country. It's unfortunate that it's about migrants. It should be about Americans. I've also listened to them talk about impeachment talking about impeachment, saying that impeachment is not the right thing to do when it comes to Secretary Mayorkas complaining about impeachment hearings. But I'd like to remind everyone that when they impeached President Trump, they introduced articles of impeachment on January 11th, held zero hearings, and then passed these articles of impeachment on January 13th. Oh my, oh my, the hypocrisy. But let's talk a little bit further. Let's talk about something I heard from one of our witnesses today, saying that impeachment is needed or necessary or warranted when this person has acted in the interest of a foreign power, that that's an impeachable offense. Well, let's talk about how we could argue Secretary Mayorkas has, has definitely acted for a foreign power. Former special agent for DEA Special Operations Division testified under oath that the cartels have control over the United States southern border. The cartels, not our government, not our border patrol. That's a foreign power. Cartels and coyotes are making around $13 billion a year in human trafficking alone off Joe Biden's open border policies and Secretary Mayorkas's willful willful disobedience in his job. The revenue is 26 times more than cartels earned under President Trump. 26 times more. That would definitely be helping a foreign power. I'm sure that money's spent in countries like Mexico. That helps their economy. Cartels control approximately 40% of Mexico. The cartels do. That means that this border crisis and the laws that are being broken are definitely in the interest of a foreign power. Now, we're also hearing a debate back and forth about policy. Is it a policy difference, or is it Secretary Mayorkas's disobedience and, and his willfulness to break our federal laws? I ask that question because I want to know, is it the Biden administration's policy to kill 300 Americans every single day to fentanyl? Is it the Biden administration's policy that cartel members are allowed to come in our country and are released? These are, these are unaccompanied minors. Are they allowed by the Biden administration's policy to come in the country and rape and murder young women? Is it the Biden administration's policy for nearly 100,000 unaccompanied minor children to go missing in our country? Is it the Biden administration's policy for child labor, migrant child labor that was talked about in the New York Times? Is that the Biden administration's policy? If so, then maybe we shouldn't be having hearings on my articles of impeachment to impeach Secretary Mayorkas Maybe we should be holding articles of impeachment on the President of the United States. Is that where we're going? What do you think about that, Ms. Pearlstein? Do you think, is it a policy difference? 
or is it Secretary Mayorkas? Which one, Biden, Joe Biden, or Secretary Mayorkas? My impression of the allegations that the majority has raised here is that they are entirely about policy differences with Ms. Perlstein, you've talked about policy in your testimony today. Policy. So that would be Joe Biden. I'm sure you voted for him for president. You're, you've been talking about the Biden administration's policy has been the cause of all of this. So is it Joe Biden's policy, the administration's policy, or is it Secretary Mayorkas? Constitution, no matter which official. Ms. Pearlstein asked you a question. Is it the Biden administration or is it Secretary Mayorkas? Not the Constitution. We're not talking about the Constitution. Is it the Biden administration's open border policies or is it Secretary Mayorkas breaking federal law? One or the other? Because the statistics are clear. Are you capable of answering that question? I'm not sure those were about four questions. No, it's one or the other. Biden administration, open border policies, or Secretary Americas? One or the other what? Who caused it? That has caused 300 Americans to die every single day. These two women sitting next to you's daughters have been murdered. We're talking about over 100,000, I'm sorry, nearly 100,000 unaccompanied minors missing in this country. We're talking about cartel members everywhere, the cartel controlling the southern border. We're talking about the massive increase in statistics. It's either one or the other. It's either the Biden administration's open border policies or it's Secretary Mayorkas. Ma'am, I'm okay, we'll take constitutional it. law. No, you okay. can't point to the Constitution. All right, so we're a little over here. General Lady Yields. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Mr. Ivey for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start off, we're gonna show a clip from an interview uh, that involved former Secretary uh, Chertoff, and I wanted to play that now, if we can. I'd like for you both very quickly to weigh in on what happens if the Republican-led Congress goes ahead with this vow to impeach or try to impeach the current Secretary of Homeland Security. Does that mean all the things you suggested don't happen and Congress is just tied in knots? Secretary Chertoff? Well, it would be a very sad day if in, in search of what is, again, a political stunt, you know, threatening to impeach Secretary Mayorkas, Congress didn't do the things, for example, that Secretary Johnson just suggested. Maybe adjust the standard with respect to asylum, create more resources that are available to adjudicate, and work out additional ways to fund the effort to undermine the cartels and the smugglers, which are a big part of this. So it would be basically putting form over substance to go through a big performance on impeachment that's never going anywhere, rather than actually working with the administration to solve the problem. Thank you. And then shortly after that, uh, former Secretary Johnson said, we can't have a secretary who's distracted by a stunt in Congress and an attempted impeachment. Um, similarly, we've had other quotes, um, I think, from Congressman Ken Buck, a Republican congressman, who's raised similar concerns about, well, who stated basically there's no grounds for impeachment. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Professor Jonathan Turley, who uh, testified, and Turley's important here because he's the witness that the Republicans called to testify uh, at the oversight hearing that made Ms. Green, I think, was referencing with respect to President Biden. Uh, and he said that, uh, at, you know, at that hearing that there was no evidence to impeach President Biden he sent us a letter to this committee saying the same thing with respect to Secretary Mayorkas. Thanks. So I, I want to sort of point out a couple of things here with respect to that. Um, to the extent we've had hearings uh, that have discussed this issue of impeachment, uh, from a legal standard, from a constitutional standpoint, the only witnesses who've actually addressed it directly are uh, Professor Bowman, who testified at the last hearing, and Professor Perlstein, who's testifying today. There's no testimony to the contrary that they provided that was given by the witnesses um, that the Republicans have called. And I, I suggest that that's in part 
or maybe in whole, because they don't have experts who will come in and say, legal experts, constitutional scholars who are experienced with respect to impeachment, will come here and raise their right hand and swear under oath that uh, the Constitution justifies impeachment with respect to Secretary Mayorkas in this case. Uh, and the absence of the testimony the ranking member raised due process issues at the beginning of the hearing, I would suggest that um, this goes to the heart of it. If there's no evidence that the Republicans have presented about um, actual impeachment, uh, the standard in the Constitution being violated, we should not be moving forward with impeachment under these circumstances. I also note Professor Perlstein's uh, testimony, the point about even if you, if you don't like the policies that Secretary Mayorkas is uh, implementing uh, and you impeach him and the Senate removes him, which they're not gonna. We've already heard from senators over there who've said, you're wasting the time, let's focus on actual legislation that they're trying to work out and get done. Um, but even if you re remove him, President Biden's just gonna move up the acting administrator, I suppose, uh, acting uh, secretary, who would continue to implement the same policy. So it's a waste of time, as uh, Secretary Chertoff called it. It's a political stunt. But more importantly, I mean, it is a total distraction from actually trying to get the legislation done. It's hard to ignore the fact that the Senate is having bipartisan negotiations on the behalf of the, the Democrats and the Republicans to try and pass a bill or put together a bill that would address these issues. The White House is working with them. House Democrats are working with them. Only the House Republicans are no-shows. They did the the field trip to uh, the border and did the photo op and sent it back. Uh, but they haven't decided to move forward with actually fixing the issues on that front. And just the last point I'll make on that front, HR2, there's a lot of talk about that's been passed and it's sitting on uh, you know, the um, Schumer's desk, uh, but it's not on his desk, it's in the trash can. And you know what, it's in McConnell's trash can too. And they said that before it was passed through. They said, you got all these poison pill provisions in here. We're not going to move this. Send us something we can actually work with. You didn't. So now they're trying to put a bill together. And everybody's on board with, with that effort except House Republicans. So if we really want to get something done, let's all come together and work on it so we can pass legislation that addresses the problem. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize Mr. Ezell, the gentleman from Mississippi, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all to our witnesses today for, for being here and providing this important information that we need. Uh, Ms. Nobles, uh, thank you for joining us here today. And I can't imagine how tough it is. Must be discussing this over and over again about the Mayorkas failed uh, border security policy. I genuinely appreciate you sharing the challenging stories and emphasizing the importance of border security. Americans are demanding we do something. Well, over 40 years in law enforcement, including the sheriff, I truly understand how challenging it is to ensure the safety of our communities. I never stopped, slowed down, or prevented my officers from enforcing the law. I swore an oath to protect the citizens of my community. Somehow, Secretary Mayorkas is making this tough job even tougher for our men and women of Border Patrol. Ms. Nobles, a report from the House Judiciary Committee pointed out several failures in vetting your daughter's killer when he crossed the border. The report showed your daughter's murder was arrested for associations with MS-13 long before he came to the United States, something that could have been verified with a simple phone call. But our members of Border Patrol uh, are, are not being allowed to do their jobs. Uh, they told me this personally when we were down there last year. Instead, there are nurse mating and making sandwiches for criminals uh, while all this stuff goes on. And, uh, you know, the buck stops at the top. This could have immediately disqualified this killer from getting in the country had they been able to do their jobs, but they have been hired to do. The report also noted that he was released after he was arrested for murder. Ms. Noble, do you have any reason to believe that Secretary Morcus has taken these reports seriously? No, he hasn't. To me, the reports are clear. His policies are failing. Do you believe he's trying to change the process of the vetting illegal aliens coming across our border? 
No, if he was, then my daughter would still be here today if they did their jobs. They did not do their jobs. It's no secret how gruesome and violent the cartels are. I've seen it personally myself. In many cases, they are even better armed than local law enforcement. In your opening statement, you quote, this isn't about immigration. This is about protecting everyone in the United States of America. Again, the American citizens are demanding that we take action. Ms. Nobles, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas' policies are strengthening the cartels? Do you believe that his policies are strengthening yes. the cartels? No mother or father should ever have to endure hearing chilling news that their child has been a victim of such a violent, heinous crime. Unfortunately, as a sheriff, I have delivered these devastating news to families. It's one of the most difficult things you'll ever do as a law enforcement officer. To end, I will simply ask, do you believe this crisis has been created by the Biden administration's policies? Yes. Thank you again, and thank you all for being here today. We will continue to be your voice. We will continue to take action. And no matter what the other side says, we're going to do something to stop this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize Ms. Ramirez, uh, the gentlelady from Illinois, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. I want to begin by acknowledging the losses here today. Ms. Nobles, Ms. Dunn, I am grieved that you have endured losing your daughters. Kayla, Maria, and Ashley, no parent should ever have to go through this loss. No parent. I also want to acknowledge the losses that are not described today. I want to name a couple of those. Victorma de la Sancha Cerros, 33-year-old mother. Jorley Ruby, 10 years old. And Jonathan Agustin Briones de la Sancha, 8 years old. They lost their lives when cruel policy choices and willful obstruction of intergovernmental coordination by the Abbott administration in Texas kept Border Patrol agents from responding to rescue a drowning mother and her children. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter these two articles into the record. Three migrants, including two children, drowned near the Texas border, and an eight-year-old migrant died after a week in U.S. attention. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Anadit Reyes Alvarez, an eight-year-old who passed away on May 2023 at a CBP detention facility in Texas when medical staff failed to review her medical documentation and provide access to a physician in emergency care. There are so many examples of the consequences of a cold disregard for our shared humanity in the absence of compassion. There's just so much pain. And it's across our communities, immigration statuses, political identities, when it comes to the humanitarian crisis within our borders and the cost of congressional inaction. You see, I just got back from Guatemala, where I heard painful stories that underline the need to act beyond our borders to address the root causes of migration. What causes a nine, a 12-year-old to cross all of Guatemala, all of Mexico, in hope to get to our southern border? What do we do to create legal pathways? And how do we understand the root cause of migration? I heard about children who are hungry, impoverished, desperate to meet the needs of their families, willing to leave villages, cross jungles, deserts, and rivers, and die in El Rio Grande just to make it to the US. I heard about the pain and trauma of separation, isolation, detention, and deportation. I saw how corruption, corporate land grabs, environmental destruction and disaster, democratic backsliding create conditions that drive migration. Pain that shows us where healing is needed. The pain that was shared with me in Guatemala requires healing that could be advanced by congressional action. Congressional action that addresses and prepares for climate migration, invests in economic development of Latin American countries, modernizes legal pathways to citizenship, strengthens democracy and combats corruption in Latin America. You see, the pain of Anadid's death requires healing that could be advanced by congressional action, like establishing humanitarian standards at CBP sites, granting immigration parole, improving adjudicatory processing capacity, or increasing personnel to reduce USCIS backlogs. 
The pain of Ikterma, Jorley, and Jonathan's death requires healing that could be advanced by congressional action. We could increase board personnel to expand screening and assistance to new arrivals. The pain of families trafficked by Abbott must be addressed by implementing federal coordination and resettlement to interior cities, expanding work permits. To heal, we have to actually talk about comprehensive immigration reform and have a conversation. Why are thousands of people wanting to cross our southern border? Professor Prostein, the testimonies we heard today show how critical it is that we take policy action, yes or no? I think these policies are of enormous pressing public importance, yes. And just for the record for the 10th time maybe, if impeachments are not an instrument for affecting policy changes, is there a legitimate basis for this impeachment, yes or no? I don't believe the Constitution supports impeachment in this case. Thank you. You see, Republicans are not interested in advancing policy change. If they were, they would stop these impeachment hearings and work with us to pass legislation. Even one of the many things I talked about, sit down with us and actually work on it. But according to Speaker Johnson, Congress can't solve border until Trump is elected or Republican is back in the White House. I mean, think about how politicized this moment is. They are parading our parade for their political purposes enough. As I said, if we are serious about this process and this solution, we would be capable to respect people's humanity and move us to a collaborative approach where our neighboring countries were able to address the root cause, keep communities safe, and honor the very fabric of our multiracial, multicultural democracy. That's what we would be doing today. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. And I yield back with hope. General Lady yields. I now recognize Mr. D'Esposito, the gentleman from New York, for his five minutes question. Well, thank you, Mr. Oh. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the witnesses this morning. It seems that uh, the other side of the aisle is talking about making this impeachment about politics. And I will tell you that this has absolutely nothing to do with politics and everything to do with the American people. Ms. Pearlstein, you mentioned in the recording that our chairman played that the founding fathers talked and what they described in the Constitution is not what we focus on right now always. You, quote, said, serious offenses against the public trust could lead to an impeachment. So, Mrs. Dunn, do you believe that what has occurred and what happened to your daughter and other teenagers and Americans throughout this country just like her, do you believe that that is a serious offense against the public trust? Yes. My border not being secure is a serious offense. Other legislators worried about other people from other countries instead of my own is a serious offense. I, I take great offense to that. I think and you need to be worried about us. Thank you. And Ms. Nobles, the same question. Do you feel that what happened uh, to your daughter and the crimes that have been committed against Americans by individuals who have illegally crossed our border, do you think that those are serious offenses against the public trust? Yes, definitely. So Secretary Mayorkas and his failed border policies have placed all Americans in danger. Every state is a border state, and every state has seen the impact of the crisis at our southern border. It's what we've outlined over the five phases in this committee. Proud to be a retired NYPD detective, having spent a career upholding my oath to protect and serve the places that I kept safe. That solemn oath is now that much harder for law enforcement throughout this country have been put on the front lines of this crisis as a direct result of the failed policies of Secretary Mayorkas. As I just stated, every state is a border state. And Ms. Nobles, your daughter was tragically murdered in Maryland, well over a thousand miles from the southern border. I know that the man who murdered your daughter was a well-known MS-13 gang member. 
In 2018, President Trump came to Long Island with then Congressman Peter King to discuss MS-13 and the heinous crimes they commit both on Long Island and throughout this country. You see, back then we had an administration who actively worked to find solutions to the issues occurring at our southern border. They worked with law enforcement to make sure that they had the tools necessary to protect and serve their communities. And now we have Secretary Mayorkas who has, have put all Americans in danger. In Nassau County, we have identified 271 identi uh, MS-13 members. Ms. Nobles, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas has taken adequate measures to ensure MS-13 members and other members of criminal organizations are not able to enter this nation le illegally? No, absolutely not. Ms. Dunn, just this morning, I spoke with Commissioner Pat Ryder, who's the commissioner of the Nassau County Police Department. My district, well over thousands of miles from the southern border, is still seeing dozens of overdoses each week with drugs flowing from our southern border. We know that it takes an incredibly small amount of fentanyl to kill someone and harm families and communities. Do you know the amount of fentanyl that killed your daughter? Sir, my daughter used one half of one tablet that she believed was Percocet. In that one half of one tablet, there was five milligrams of fentanyl, okay. enough to kill two and a half people. Two and a half people. Correct. In five milligrams. Yes. And since Mayorkas has been the Secretary of Homeland Security, 25 billion milligrams of fentanyl has come across our southern border and unfortunately has killed many others tragically, just like your daughter. Yes. It is very clear that America and the people who live here are at risk and Sec Secretary Mayorkas deserves to be impeached because he has committed serious offenses against the public trust of the United States of America. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Goldman, for five minutes questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank our witnesses uh, for being here today, Ms. Nobles and Ms. Dunn. Uh, I just want to express uh, my sincere condolences. I was a federal prosecutor for 10 years who charged people for gang-related and drug trafficking crimes. Um, unfortunately, this is not the first time I've had to interact with families of victims. And my heart goes out to you. And I, I just want, I want to apologize in some ways to you that you are here um, really to share your story, but you're being used in, as a fact witness for an impeachment um, investigation. And obviously, given you know, what your experience has been, you don't have the background um, to understand what a high crime misdemeanor is and how it relates to this. And so I, I hope that um, you're, you're handling that okay. Um, you know, one of the things that the chairman said at the beginning of his opening statement was uh, that he wishes that Democrats would turn our sympathy um, into action. Uh, and quite ironically said, thoughts and prayers are not enough. At first, I thought we were at a gun violence um, hearing where uh, we were talking about the repeated thoughts and prayers of the two mass shootings that happen every day. But uh, I do want to just go through some of the uh, actions, as, as the chairman pointed out, turn sympathy into action. Um, because I assume, Ms. Dunn, you, you would agree, would you not, that it would help to stop the fentanyl trade and fentanyl trafficking from coming into this country if we had more law enforcement officers at the border and more resources and technology to stop the fentanyl from coming in. Do you, do you agree with that? I disagree with that because Border Patrol is now being used to make sandwiches and to screen people and let them into our country. Okay, well, so... So I disagree it, with you. So you're, you're saying that the... You're, so you're saying that 
uh, you're upset because the Border Patrol is not doing, uh, is making sandwiches, I think you said, so you don't think it would be helpful to have more Border Patrol officers who are charged with stopping the fentanyl trade? I would like the Border Patrol to be able to do the job that they were hired to do. Well, one way, Every Border one way, Patrol sorry. officer that I have spoken to has told me that their hands are tied by this administration and Mr. Mayorkas. I've been well, to the border, sir, have you? The, H have you? I, I'm, excuse me, I'm asking the I, question. I'm just wondering. And the, 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 the problem with that is that um, in Congress, this, this Congress, we have um, interviewed nine senior officials uh, of the, of, under DHS in, in a variety of different capacities. Um, every single one of them has said that it would be helpful to provide more resources at the border to stop the flow of fentanyl coming in. And that is actually exactly what President Biden has done. Uh, in last year's budget, fiscal year 2023, the appropriations um, it included 300 additional U.S. Border Patrol agents, which was the first increase since 2011 included 125 more CBP officers, $70 million for non-intrusive inspection, and 200 House Republicans, including every single Republican serving at the time who currently sits on this committee, voted against that bill. Under the Biden administration, the Department of Homeland Security has seized more fentanyl and arrested more criminals for fentanyl-related crimes in the last two years than in the previous five years combined. And even in this Congress, when we had the Department of Homeland Security appropriations markup, Mr. Correa offered an amendment that would provide more money and more uh, resources for the border to stop the fentanyl trade and every single Republican voted it down. But that's not it. Even with the supplemental request from the White House, they requested $1.2 billion to crack down on the trafficking of dangerous and lethal illicit drugs like fentanyl, including over $300 million for the most effective non-intrusive inspection systems. And of course, 90% of fentanyl comes through the ports of entry, so having those inspection systems would do it. Again, the Republicans will not support the border with additional resources to do the job that the Secretary wants to do. And so we are here yet again for a political stunt to make an argument that this administration is not doing anything, even as it is negotiating to try to address the problems at the border, and even as it is trying to increase the number of border agents and technology to address the fentanyl system. Let's stop this sham impeachment hearing, and let's go negotiate with the Senate and the White House who are doing that right now with Secretary Mayorkas to address the problems at the border. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Dunn, I was watching you as we uh, listened to my friend from New York just now and, and uh, heard what you said. Uh, you did a fantastic job sort of uh, defeating his point in the little bit of time he gave you. Uh, but as he was saying that what that they make the issue that Republicans aren't sending more money to the border. Uh, what every jurisdiction in the United States, notably New York, Chicago, and others are suffering is a deluge of immigrants that the country cannot assimilate, that are not prepared to be assimilated culturally, by, by linguistic background, by experience. They're not, we can't get, it, get the job done that way. The only proposals that Democrats have offered let this go down on record. The only proposals that have been offered is to send more money to the border, which will be used to process more immigrants faster into the country, number one, or number two, to legalize them all, grant them amnesty, as if that would somehow address any of the problems that we're experiencing. Not one of them would be addressed. So I appreciate Ms. Nobles, you and Ms. Dunn, you for being here. It must be ex particularly infuriating to hear that when you've suffered the ultimate uh, victimhood from the violations of law that the Secretary of Homeland Security has administered. So, Ms. Professor Perlstein, I want to go to you, though, because I want to talk about, talk about that victim, the rule of law. Um, 
you said in your paper uh, in defense of Secretary Mayorkas that to the extent the majority of reports allegations against the Secretary are related to those policies, in particular the suggestion that Secretary Mayorkas somehow exceeded the scope of his lawful authority to set priorities for the enforcement of U.S. immigration law. That claim has been rejected most recently by an overwhelming bipartisan majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, are you referring to the United States Te versus Texas case from last June? I am. But there, the, the majority opinion says, quote, we take no position on whether the executive branch here is complying with its legal obligations. We hold only that the federal courts are not the proper forum to resolve this dispute. So when you read that language, how do you come to the conclusion that the court decided that Secretary Mayorkas is acting in accordance with his legal responsibilities? The basis of the court's ruling on standing that you just described was, as Justice Kavanaugh's opinion for the majority said, the authority to decide how to prioritize and how aggressively to pursue legal actions against defendants belongs to the executive branch under Article II. That was the basis of the ruling that was there is no standing in this case. Well, they also said words, they've taken no position whether the justice, executive they, branch is complying with its legal they, obligations. How is Trump that? Trump appointed said this is authority that belongs exclusively to the executive branch. Right. What you're referring to is the court says we're not in the business of refereeing anything where the executive has any amount of prosecutorial discretion. But they also say we're not deciding here whether the executive branch is complying with its legal obligations. Both of those propositions are true. They're both in the opinion, are they not, ma'am? The court found that there was no standing because... No, ma'am, I asked you a question. The this proposition is in the opinion as well, correct? I read it. It's accurate. The court found there was no standing. That is also true. I didn't ask you about standing. I asked you whether this language that I just read, where the court said we're not determining whether the executive branch is complying with its legal obligations, that's also in the court's opinion, correct? That may be in the court's opinion. But that's what, what I said... asked. Thank you. Let me ask you this. At the oral argument... This was Justice Kavanaugh's question to the Solicitor General, Solicitor General of the United States. I think your position is, instead of judicial review, Congress has to resort to shutting down the government or impeachment or dramatic steps if, it, if some administration comes in and says, we're not going to enforce laws, or at least not going to enforce the laws to the degree that Congress, by law, has said the laws should be enforced. And that's forcing, I mean, I understand your position, but it's forcing Congress to take dramatic steps. Isn't that what he said at oral argument? I don't have the transcript of oral argument. All right, do you argument. disagree with his proposition as I just recited it to you? Justice Alito said in his lone dissent that impeachment along with funding cutoffs and others were among the potentially available remedies that Congress has. The majority opinion, none of the other eight justices, including all of the justices appointed by the former president, mentioned impeachment in that context. So you're aware, are you familiar with the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act of 1996? It's a large act, which part? The part that the, that the United States Supreme Court considered in United States versus Texas? I've read the case. Okay, you know that, as Justice Des Alito describes in the dissent, that in that situation, the Congress decided to re withdraw some of the discretion the, the executive has by requiring detention and uh, it, it spe specifically in certain cases, right? What the court said was that for the last 27 years since these laws, that law was enacted in their current form, all five presidential administrations have determined the resource constraints necessitated prioritization in making immigration addressed. If you evaded a question like that before the bench, they would not like it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. The, the gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, for his five minutes yeah, questioning. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Chairman. First, I, I want to um, thank Ms. Nobles and Ms. Dunn, Mrs. Dunn for testifying and, and express my condolences for uh, the loss uh, of your children, and to tell you that I have constituents as well who have lost uh, children uh, to fentanyl, and I know it's not easy to come to Congress uh, and to talk about it, and I hope that what you will find one day is a Congress that will unite and do everything it can uh, to make sure that we reduce uh, these deaths. Um, I also wish we could hear from Secretary Mayorkas, uh, because uh, he has stated he wants to come and testify, and I know 
Uh, Mr. Magaziner put into the record a letter from Mr. Mayorkas uh, stating that he, again, would be willing to testify. He's testified 27 times to Congress, more than any other cabinet official, uh, and, and twice uh, last year before this uh, committee, uh, and he has made his senior uh, officials uh, available. Um, and, and to the witnesses who have come here today, if you came looking for an audience uh, that is serious and, and wants, you know, to take up this issue, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that when it comes to immigration solutions, uh, too many of my uh, colleagues would rather have the issue uh, than the fix. Uh, and I am speaking for myself here, uh, and I know I probably speak for many of my colleagues. Uh, I, I don't want open borders. Uh, I want a secure border. That's why I have supported surging more border agents uh, at the border. That's why I support deploying more uh, technologies at the border. That's why I support having more barriers uh, at the border. Uh, and that's why I want to make sure that we also address the workforce crisis in America uh, by, you know, increasing legal immigration uh, and increasing, you know, immigrants who can work the jobs that Americans are just not going to work so we can reduce the costs and give more financial breathing room to families uh, in this country. You're not going to find that here. This is not where they do that. This is where they seek fame uh, rather than uh, a fix. And, and what you're going to find here is that if we were to solve this crisis, this committee wouldn't have anything uh, to talk about. And, and that's more important uh, to the Speaker uh, of this House. And that's more important uh, to the person that too many of them rely upon uh, when they make decisions, which is the former uh, president. I want to just give you a couple examples. Uh, Sergeant Daniels, uh, I'm sorry he can't be here today because last time he was here, I asked him if he would support additional Border Patrol agents as the Senate passed with 68 Republicans and Democrats uh, not too long ago, and he said he would. And, and I would like to have unanimous consent to enter into the record his written testimony to our committee and to the Oversight Committee uh, where he said that. That objection so ordered. So then you have... Just recently on CNN, Jake Tapper asked Speaker Johnson, look, President Biden wants to give you more money at the border. Uh, would you take that? And, and Speaker Johnson said no. Again, just revealing and saying out loud what we all know, which is that they don't want to solve this problem. They, they want to use it and exploit it and exploit victims so they have a political narrative. Senate negotiations are taking place right now where in good faith, Democrats and Republicans are working to try and find more solutions uh, and more resources at the border. And that is dead on arrival here, where Republican colleagues have said out loud, we're never going to support that. That would help the president. They've actually said that. My Democratic colleagues want the fix. MAGA Republicans want the fiction. My Democratic colleagues want the fix. My MAGA colleagues want Fox. My Democratic colleagues want the fix. My MAGA colleagues want the fame. That's what this is entirely about. And if you have any questions as to whether that's what this is about, one of the questions earlier was asking a professor who came here to talk about immigration and the Constitution whether she would condemn Hamas's attack on October 7th. Everyone here condemns Hamas's attack on October 7th. But if that same member was asked, would you condemn Donald Trump's role in the January 6th insurrection, or would you condemn the people on this committee who call the January 6th terrorists hostages, an insult to the actual hostages, American hostages, in Gaza right now? He would take a pass. He wouldn't want to answer the question. They couldn't answer the question because they won't condemn it. They don't want the fix. They want the fiction. If they were not willing to hold Donald Trump accountable for his impeachable crimes, I don't really want their hot time take. Time has expired. The I don't want their hot take. New York on Secretary Meyer is recognized for back. five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Nobles, Ms. Nunn, I'm very sorry for uh, your loss, losses. Um, you know, I don't have children. I couldn't imagine what you've you've gone through. Um, but uh, Ms. Nobles, I want to start with you. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services have systems in place to ensure that unaccompanied alien children from non-contiguous countries are transferred from Customs and Border Protection to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR. The House Judiciary Report regarding your daughter's murder notes that ORR lost track of more than 
85,000 children and placed fewer than 15,000 follow-up calls after discharging an additional 32,000 children. At no point did anyone from CBP or HHS flag this violent criminal who had a criminal gang history along with multiple MS-13 tattoos. Snobles, does this sound like a well-run system meant to protect American people? No. Her murderer was apprehended at the border of March of 2022. They had him. They did not check. They didn't check for his background check. They let him go to an unknown sponsor. Don't even know who the sponsor is. And she takes him to Frederick, Maryland, yeah. from Texas to Maryland. And then he ended up in the same trailer as my daughter. As you said, the, the, as it turns out, the murderer was a known gang member, was a 16-year-old known gang member affiliated with MS-13 in El Salvador. And since the current administration's open border policy began, we've seen a sharp increase in the number of known criminals crossing our southern border. That has included members of MS-13 whose motto is kill, rape, and control. My district on Long Island has suffered from high levels of gang activity, especially MS-13, for years. Um, it stopped actually when uh, the former president increased, uh, he, when he increased uh, FBI and cooperation and police protection on Long Island. So we had, we, we were actually winning the battle for a while. Um, but unfortunately that's, that's starting to change again. And uh, you know, just this summer, a member of MS-13 pled guilty to the murder on Long Island, to, pled guilty to the murder of two teenage girls who were attacked with ba baseball bats and machetes. Um, this is just one of the many examples. Do you think border security and proper alien vetting is a national security issue? Yes. And supposedly he's 16. We don't know his real age. Exactly. They don't, but they, they're treating him as a juvenile. But one well, that's actually that's true. One of the uh, for the UAC is one of the when I went to the one of the times I went to the border because I've been several times. Um, CBP was saying that uh, when they were processing people who were trying to be under, uh, trying to sh sh uh, show that they're under 18, they actually found real documentation showing they were between the ages of 25 and 30. So it's, it, we don't know exactly how old it is, like you said. No. Um, this committee has been focused on Biden administration's refusal to secure our southwest border and vet alien arrivals. A report from the House Judiciary Committee, like I said, before, like I mentioned before, pointed out multiple vetting failures with your daughter's killer. Its report shows that your daughter's murder was arrested for association with MS-13 well before he came to the United States, something that the U.S. officials verified easily after the murder. Unfortunately, it was after. Um, and you, like you said, the report also noted that the alien was released after he was arrested for murder. Do you think Secretary Mayorkas has done an adequate job vetting illegal aliens coming across our border? No, because if he was vetted, he would have never been allowed in. He would have never been allowed to come here and commit that horrific crime on my daughter. Thank you for your answers, and I'm, again, I'm very sorry uh, for your Thank loss. You. Um, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just no. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm from New York. It's sometimes oh, our okay. tone gets. We get. I'm not yelling. This is just how I talk. That's well, no, I was telling you that I wasn't yelling <laughs> at you. Oh. No, <laughs> I was just you know. Um, Miss Dunn, quickly, the uh, the United States is in a fentanyl crisis. We all know that, um, and it's being inflamed by the open southwest border. Illicit narcotics have resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths in just the past few years. Fentanyl is highly addictive, incredibly potent, and easy to make, which is why it's a favorite drug for the cartels and drug traffickers. I'm sure you've answered this already today multiple times, but I think it's worth getting it on the record uh, multiple times. Do you believe that S Secretary Orcas's open borders have exasper exasperated, exacerbated the fentanyl epidemic? Yes, I believe so. Do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas is doing enough to fight the scourge of fentanyl? Not at all, no. Why not? Don't, I, he, he needs to lock down that border. Everyone keeps saying, give them more money. Those poor Border Patrol agents are now the welcoming committee. They are ordered to be the welcoming committee. They don't want to be the welcoming committee. They're told to do that by Mayorkas, by this administration, just like the young lady next to you had said, it's either Mayorkas or the Biden administration. Somebody is telling the poor border patrol to not do their job. No matter how much money you give them, they're still not gonna be allowed to do their job. 
The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our witnesses. I um, want to uh, just get back to where we're here. This is, of course, another effort, and this hearing is really about demonizing migrants and, again, smearing Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, Professor Perlstein, thank you for being here. Are, are there any grounds, again, for impeaching Secretary Mayorkas under the Constitution? I don't believe the Constitution supports impeachment in this case. Thank you. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the most important question and, and really gets to the heart of why we're here today. We talked a lot about the fentanyl crisis and fentanyl in this committee and, and today, but the fentanyl crisis we know is a tragedy. Um, but what we also think it's important to remember who didn't end the fentanyl crisis. That was actually Donald Trump. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to introduce this article titled Synthetic, Synthetic Opioid Overdose Deaths Soared While Trump Was President. I also would like to, into the record, put this other article opioid crisis, critics say Trump fumbled response to another deadly epidemic. And I bring these documents up because I think it's really important to note that during Trump's presidency, the fentanyl crisis had already been a huge challenge across this country. In fact, Trump said before the 2016 election, he said the opioid crisis was destroying lives and shattering families. And he said, quote, we are going to stop the inflow of drugs into New Hampshire and into our country 100%, 100%. Trump promised. In 2017, Trump's first year in office, more than 42,000 Americans died from overdoses linked to heroin, fentanyl, and prescription opioids. So there was a huge fentanyl problem when Donald Trump was president. The administration didn't even bother to issue a national strategy on fentanyl in his first two years in office. So I think it's crazy that the majority is trying to turn this into a public health crisis that somehow knew or began during the Biden administration. Unfortunately, this is about much larger issues that we have, because our conversation today isn't about the Constitution or the law. It's not even about securing the border. The majority is not interested in solutions. Donald Trump, as always, has said the quiet part out loud when he said immigrants, and I quote, are poisoning the blood of our country. As, as we know, this is, this is rhetoric uh, that can be compared to Hitler and the kind of rhetoric that he used. Extremists here in Congress also continue to push issues like the Great Replacement Theory. And we should be clear, immigrants are some of the most patriotic and hardworking people there are in this country. I just heard a committee member say, and I quote, um, th they are not prepared to be assimilated, at talking about immigrants. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I think I'm pretty well assimilated here. I am a member of Congress. And so I think it's very un-American to attack and demonize migrants um, the way that some in this majority continue to do. Um, immigrants aren't here to poison or victimize the American people. I also want to just touch on this issue of crime. Um, some in the, the majority continue to talk about crime, and crime is a horrific tragedy. Clearly, I, I feel horrible for, the, for our witnesses that are here that have lost um, members of their family. But let's look at real data as well. Both undocumented and documented immigrants are much less likely to commit crimes or be incarcerated than native-born American citizens. Our border communities are often safer from violent crimes than many interior cities. And according to FBI crime data, crime in border communities was measured to actually be 15% lower than the national average. So from a crime perspective, cr more crime is being committed by American citizens than those folks that are undocumented or that are immigrants. Democrats also want an orderly and secure border. We want real solutions to the fentanyl crisis, but we need to understand the problems we're trying to solve need solutions, legislation, not impeachments of the secretary, and certainly not impeachments of President Biden. Uh, the idea that any of these problems will be solved by the border alone, I think, is also crazy. These problems have existed for decades. We haven't had immigration reform or any sort of policy in over 30 years. And without legal pathways, we will never have an orderly border. That is also a fact. And we can't have a conversation with a with a president, with a presidential candidate, a former president who thinks immigrants are poisoning the blood of our nation, who thinks that we should build a moat with alligators along the border, who thinks that we should put spikes on the wall that he's trying to build, who has said that we should shoot migrants in the legs as they're crossing the border, who thinks we should send missiles into northern Mexico. These are the ideas being offered by the, no the likely nominee of the Republican Party and by many on this committee and in the Republican majority. We need to have real solutions. We, need, we don't need uh, Donald Trump's horrific policies to come back to this country, and we certainly shouldn't be impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. And with that, I yield back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. 
For months now, we have been hearing the staggering statistics about the catastrophe at our southern border, the millions of migrants coming across our border illegally, the human trafficking, the fentanyl, the lost unaccompanied minors. But today we hear something that is even more important than that. Today we hear the real personal stories of unfathomable loss and irreplaceable lives. And yet, even in the face of this testimony that we have heard today and the testimony that came before it, our colleagues across the aisle impugn the purpose and the necessity of this hearing, calling it a political sham, calling it a stunt, calling it theater. And they suggest that what we actually need to do is pass more laws. So as a former federal prosecutor and judge, I'll start today with a refresher on a few of the things that are currently illegal in the United States of America. It is illegal to traffic fentanyl in the United States of America. Human trafficking is illegal in this country. Theft is illegal in this country. Rape and murder are illegal in this country. What's more? The Department of Homeland Security has an absolute obligation to detain and remove those who enter this country illegally. We do not need more laws. We need a President of the United States and a Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security who enforce the laws of this country. But what do we have instead? An administration that has deliberately subverted the duly enacted laws of the United States of America that have deliberately defied the orders of courts in this United States of America who have ordered and directed that they desist, they desist these unlawful policies. We have a Department of Homeland Security that has defied inquiries from the United States Congress. And as for the 27 appearances of Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in front of this Congress, not one of those times did he admit that we have lost operational control of our border, that we have ceded control of our border to the Mexican drug cartels, or acknowledge the scope, scale, and crisis that our communities all across America face as a consequence, as a direct consequence of these lawless policies. Every single time an individual is allowed to enter this country unlawfully, Americans are less safe. Ms. Nobles, Mrs. Dunn, as a mother, I see my child and my family in those photos that you shared with us today. And it is truly something that we cannot fathom, the loss that you have each suffered. I thank you for your willingness to come here today and share with us your stories. I would like to hear your perspective, please, on what more Congress could be doing to support you and to try to prevent this type of unspeakable tragedy from happening in the lives of another family. We'll start with you, Ms. Nobles. I would like to see every um, illegal immigrant who wants to come here to be properly vetted and background checked. I hear a lot about more funding resources and all that. How is that going to help them do their job in the first place? They failed Kayla by not checking her murderer's background and did not make that one phone call. One, one phone call could have saved my baby's life. They didn't. And after he was arrested, they put him, um, Child Protective Services took him and put him in an unsecured children's home with other children. And I know Americans commit crimes on other Americans, but why do we have to take other countries' trash? Why do we need them? Ms. Dunn? We, we talked about a lot today um, about more resources at the border. And, and I appreciate that and I respect that. But I don't think that members in this room and other rooms at the Capitol understand that we are actually at war. And we're at war with the cartels. We're, we're losing our children. We're losing a generation of children. 
We're at war. We need our military at the border. That's what we need. We don't need more border patrol. We need our military at the border stopping the drugs, stopping people from coming in. They can't come in. We're full. We're closed. That's it. No more money. No more. No more sandwiches. It's closed. I'm sorry. Come through the proper challenge channels. I am a first-generation American. My parents both migrated here. Guess what? They did it legally. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, my time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for, for appearing here today. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate you sharing your stories, and, um, and I'm sorry for your immeasurable grief. Um, and the folks on this committee look forward to, to working together in a way where we can solve some of the challenges that are facing our country. But since this is an impeachment hearing, I will uh, direct my questions to Professor Perlstein. As the professor has observed, there are provisions of the Constitution that are murky and subject to debate and provisions that are clear. Article 2, Section 4 is clear. Treason, bri bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors are the only constitutionally permissible grounds for impeachment. My Republican colleagues have not come close to making a constitutionally sound case for impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas. They have incorrectly argued that the Secretary's designations of certain groups are el for, as eligible for parole constitutes, quote, mass parole, and is inconsistent with law. Each case is considered on a discretionary case-by-case -case basis, which is a requirement in the Immigration and Nationality Act. It is worth noting that parole authority has been used by every administration since President Eisenhower, who paroled 30,000 Hungarian nationals fleeing communism. Professor Perlstein, does the Secretary's exercise of well-established parole authority constitute treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors? I don't believe it does, no. Thank you. My Republican colleagues have also argued that Secretary Mayorkas is violating the law by releasing migrants awaiting adjudication of their asylum claims. That claim is not true, and that practice is not new. In fact, DHS released hundreds of thousands of individuals at the U.S.-Mexico border under President Trump. Professor Perlstein, does detaining migrants in a matter consistent with the law and the resources provided by this Congress constitute treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors? No, it doesn't. Finally, my Republican colleagues have also incorrectly criticized the Secretary's guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration law, which prioritize enforcement actions based on national security, public safety, and border security. But as Justice Kavanaugh observed in United States v. Texas, Article II of the Constitution confers upon the executive branch the, quote, authority to decide how to prioritize and how aggressively to pursue legal actions against defendants who violate the law, and that principle extends to the immigration context. Professor Perlstein, does exercising well-established authority to prioritize immigration enforcement actions constitute treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors? No, sir. Thank you. This committee has engaged in months of so-called investigations into the administration's border security policies. Despite all of the time and resources committee Republicans have invested, they still cannot make a case for impeaching the secretary that meets constitutional muster. Instead of wasting more time on a baseless impeachment, we should get back to the work of passing bills that will actually help solve problems. But Republicans don't seem interested in that. They made their immigration proposal, HR2, as cruel and unworkable as possible, rejecting every amendment Democrats on this committee offered in good faith, amendments some Republicans agreed would improve the bill. Everyone on this committee wants to fight the scourge of fentanyl in this country. That's why during our markup of HR2, I offered an amendment to authorize the Biden administration's Operation Blue Lotus, an aggressive strategy for fighting drug trafficking with a proven record of stopping fentanyl from being smuggled into the country. But every one of, the Repu of my Republican colleagues voted against it. Why? Because while they talk the talk, they refuse to walk the walk. HR2, you talk about it in every response. What's your alternative to HR2? Why does it have to be HR2 or nothing? If you're serious about figuring out the border, work with us. Let's come up with another solution. But you go back to HR2 every time you're challenged about the substance of what we're doing here while you are in the majority on the border. Come up with a second proposal or a third proposal that can pass this house, be signed into law, and we can get to work. You sit on HR2. You point to HR2 and say, that's the work we've done. 
Meanwhile, you bring these witnesses here to talk about the tragedies they've experienced, but what are we doing now? What's your proposal now besides HR2? There's nothing. There's nothing. This is, a, this is about scoring political points. You want to make this administration look weak on the border? When are we going to put our country above party again? I believe in you guys. I believe you want to do that. Let's do it. But talking about HR2 as a solution is a farce. And uh, one day I do hope that we can work together on these issues. I would love to do that because the work of this country is critical and we need to get to it. With that, I yield back. Now recognize the gentleman from New York for five minutes of questioning. I appreciate my colleague from New Jersey's comments. I do believe he's operating in good faith, but I just think he's wrong. Um, and while there's squabbles between members of both parties in this committee, the executive branch has every power uh, in its tool sh in its toolbox to get this done right away. It can reinstate Remain in Mexico, can stop the repositioning of border agents away from the border and towards migrant processing centers. Uh, it could do things on its own through executive action to, to clean up this mess. HR2 is our response to that, that would require the administration to do those things to protect Americans. Um, Madam Chairwoman, we've spent 13 months in this committee uh, laying out the case that our, that our border is not secure. And Americans are with us with, on this. 67% uh, of Americans um, think the president is failing in his duty to secure the border. Uh, much of our case in the last 13 months has been backed up by data, some pretty big numbers. Millions of migrants unlawfully mass paroled into the United States. Hundreds of thousands of gotaways and tens of thousands of fentanyl deaths. But today it's not about the data. Um, before us today are two actual victims of Secretary Mayorkas's open border. A mother whose daughter was sexually assaulted and murdered by an MS-13 member, and another member whose daughter was fatally poisoned by fentanyl. Ms. Dunham, Ms. Nobles, um, as a father of three young girls for whom I would do and give anything, I can literally not imagine what you're going through. I appreciate you being here today, um, ripping off some of the scabs of the wound that has been caused and telling us your story so that we could be more informed and, uh, and help solve this problem. Appreciate you being here today. Uh, Madam Chairman, if we had a more secure border, these horrific tragedies could have been avoided. If Secretary Mayorkas stopped paroling mass groups of migrants into the United States, these tragedies could have been avoided. If Secretary Mayorkas stopped repositioning border agents away from the border, just to sit behind a desk to process more and more unvetted migrants into the United States, we would have less grieving mothers. Madam Chairman, the Biden administration has often falsely claimed that 90% of all fentanyl comes through ports of entry. I actually have a video of Secretary Mayorkas claiming um, that, and if we could play that, please. And people should understand, it is not in between the ports of entry uh, that the majority of, of fentanyl is sought to be smuggled. It's not through the migrants that we encounter in between the ports of entry. It's through passenger vehicles, through commercial trucks at our ports of entry where the substance is concealed in compartments. Congressman, um, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection data um, evidences that more than 90 percent of the fentanyl that enters this country is coming through the ports of entry. The secretary is wrong, and he's smart enough to know that he's wrong. 90% only accounts for what is seized and not what actually makes it across the borders. Only the cartels probably, uh, who are profiting millions, tens of millions a month, know how much fentanyl is actually making it across the borders. In fact, Border Patrol officials have told this committee they believe that only 5 to 10% of fentanyl is actually seized. The fact that there are more than 70,000 deaths in our country in 2022 from fentanyl should be a telltale sign that fentanyl is flooding into this country, not only through ports of entry, but in between ports of entry as well. Ms. Dunn, um, do you think that pulling border patrol agents away from the border just to have them sit behind a desk to process, to mass process more and more migrants into the country is a wise decision? No. Do you think that that decision leads to more opportunities for the cartels to traffic fentanyl into this country? Yes. Thank you. And what impact, um, and I know you have a, the most personal of experience, um, but what impact do you think that fentanyl has had on the public health of the United States? Well, um, the most obvious one in, that I can see is I have a grandson that doesn't have a mother. He has other family 
and is able to raise him. But we haven't even begun to talk about the foster care system and how many children have lost their parents. Little babies under 18 that are now wards of the states. Where's all that money coming from? And let's think about the traumas and sadness and what it's like to not have parents because their parents died from fentanyl. Ms. Dunn, the secretary knows your story um, and he knows of other stories like yours and he hasn't changed his policies. He hasn't insisted those border agents stay on the border. He hasn't canceled the mass parole of migrants in the United States. What could you say with respect to the secretary's likely approach and his care for situations like yours, given that he hasn't changed his policies? It's very difficult for me to contain what I would say. How I about that? I appreciate that. I'd rather, I'd rather not say what I would like to say. You're a classy person, and I appreciate you being here before us today. I yield. The gentleman yields. I now recognize Ms. Clark from New York for her uh, five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our ranking member. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to our witnesses for appearing here today, and to our bereaved mothers. Um, you have my deepest condolences. Earlier today, my colleagues discuss, discussed Republican opposition to providing CBP much needed resources in the FY 2023 funding bill. But that isn't the only time Republicans have opposed resources to secure our border. In October, President Biden sent Congress a supplemental funding request for FY 2024, which included an additional $13.6 billion for border security. It would provide an additional 1,300 Border Patrol agents to work alongside the 20,200 20, agents already funded by the requested FY 2024 budget, 375 immigration judges, teams to strengthen the immigration court system, 1,600 asylum officers to speed up processing of asylum claims, 1,000 CBP officers with a focus on countering fentanyl, new detection technology for ports of entry, more immigration detention beds, additional investigative capabilities to combat fentanyl trafficking, and 600 million dollars more in grants to help communities receiving migrants, among other investments. As Secretary Mayorkas and bipartisan members of the Senate are in negotiations to get these much needed resources enacted, House Republicans are just absent. Instead, they are focused on impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. Professor Perlstein, do impeachment resolutions change policy? No, ma'am. Do they provide resources or authorize funding? No, ma'am. Even if House Republicans attempted to impeach Secretary Mayorkas is successful, the Senate would have to convict. Isn't that correct? Yes, that's true. And how many senators are required to convict, convict the secretary? Conviction requires two-thirds of the Senate. After a conviction, what happens next? Uh, the person would be removed from office, and the president has the opportunity to appoint uh, someone new. The secretary would be removed, and for a period of time pending confirmation of a new secretary, another official would serve as acting secretary. Is that correct? That's correct. Would that individual be obligated to execute the administration's policies? Yes, he serves at the pleasure of the president. So functionally, nothing would change. That's correct. If instead, House Republicans decided to negotiate and pass the president's supplemental appropriations, what effect would that have on resources and policy? Congress could pass laws today that have enormous effect, not just on the availability of resources, but how those resources are allocated. So if Congress is unhappy with, for example, where officers are placed, um, Congress can impose conditions on existing funds that require the president to do something different. If they believe that the president or the secretary is not complying with those laws, they can challenge them in court, and that's exactly the process that's been playing out in recent years. Very well. 
Mr. Chairman, Republicans have a choice. They can continue to pursue this sham impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas, which will change nothing, and in fact could slow down efforts to address challenges at the Southwest border, or they can work with the White House and bipartisan members of the Senate on legislation to improve border security and reduce drug trafficking. I urge my colleagues to get back to work for the American people. And with that, I thank you and I yield back. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize Mr. Strong for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Nobles, my heart goes out to you for the loss of your daughter. Uh, thank you for being here with us today and for sharing her story. As you've been told, this committee uh, today, uh, the man that took Kayla's life was in this country illegally. He was originally from El Salvador, where he was no, a known member of the MS-13 gang, a fact which was later easily verified, both by his gang tattoos and by a simple call to the El Salvador government. Ms. Nobles, does it concern you that Secretary Mayorkas has not made any significant changes to his border policies, especially ones that uh, make it easier for illegal aliens to enter and uh, continually be released into our country without proper vetting? Yes, very concerning, because I don't want this to happen to someone else's daughter or child. Thank you. In August of 2023, there was an individual arrested in Alabama whose background is stunningly similar to Kayla's murder. He was an El Salvador illegal here in the U.S. He was also a member of the MS-13 and on El Salvador's top 100 most wanted list. He earned a spot on this list for aggravated kidnapping, attempted ag ag aggravated homicide, aggravated homicide, aggravated extortion, and terrorist organization. He was previously deported, yet Mayorkas opened the border and was able to make, uh, make it uh, back into this country. Uh, you start looking at this, Ms. Noble, this illustrates um, what we both know to be true. These are unfortunately not isolated events. As a matter of fact, from fiscal year 2021 to date, Border Patrol has recorded 41,162 arrests of illegal aliens with criminal backgrounds, approximately 88% higher than the combined uh, previous fiscal years, um, uh, the four years combined. Ms. Nobles, shouldn't just one instance that an illegal alien has endangered or taken the life of an innocent American like your daughter be a wake-up call to Secretary Mayorkas and President Biden? Yes, most definitely. As a member just said, there are no experts to raise their hands and say Mayorkas should be impeached. Ms. No uh, Ms. Nobles and Ms. Dunn, let me get one thing straight. You're experts. You lost it all. As a matter of fact, it has been more than just one instance. In Alabama alone, May 2023, an illegal alien from Honduras raped a teenage girl in a restaurant bathroom. November 2022, an illegal alien sodomized a 13-year-old boy. July 2022, an illegal immigrant from Mexico killed and dismembered a woman's body and her child. The lone survivor, a 12-year-old girl, escaped after watching this horrific scene and being held captive with the decomposing remains. How many more stories like this will it take for Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration to wake up? The Stay in Mexico Act, it worked. The Stay in Mexico Act, it worked. I don't care which president was there, whether it was Obama, whether it was Trump, the Stay in Mexico Act worked. Process them, fuel up ice air, send them back to the country of their origin. If not this, then what will compel them to act? I agree, Secretary Mayorkas, is not the solution. He is part of the problem. He created this circus. He has failed to carry out U.S. law. 8.5 million illegals have crossed the southern border from 160 company, uh, countries. They've come into our country. They're invading our country from 160 countries. Fentanyl crossing the border by planes, mules, drones, 
Child slavery, uh, slavery is rampant, and both sides of the aisle know it. 85,000 children illegally brought into America, and this administration says we have no clue where they are. No clue where they are. Guess what? They're in sex slavery in our country. Let me answer the fact. But I'm telling you right now, both of you are experts. You lost it all. You lost your daughters. You're an expert, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen yields, I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Burkeen, for his five minutes of testimony or uh, questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, given a markup that's going on in budget, appreciate your indulgences um, with me slipping in. Um, you know, just as, as my colleague just talked about, just the great loss. Uh, thank you both very much for uh, your courage, given what you've been through. Um, we know that the decisions by my orcas, in addition to just this administration's decisions, have caused chaos on our southern border. Um, just their reluctance to simply enforce congressional law, um, whether it's parole, um, detention, deportation, um, these are all things that Congress set up as a barrier to protect us against the heinous acts that, that uh, uh, the mothers in this room um, have, uh, your families have been the victims of. I, uh, I want to ask you, um, Ms. Nobles, uh, your, in your testimony, you said that the El Salvadorian government had a documented criminal history of your, your daughter's murderer. Now we're talking about an illegal alien um, who uh, assaulted, sexually assaulted, and murdered your daughter. And they were aware of this involvement and that uh, there was an MS-13 gang membership that was also associated with this individual. How long after your daughter's death were you made aware of this? We, at, um, at first, we did not know that he, it was MS-13 until after the DNA um, evidence came back, linked him, and then once he was arrested, then we were told it was an MS-13 gang member. And he has like 11 charges against him right now. And, and what was the federal agency that provided that information to you? Um, it was no federal. Um, it was, it, it, it took the local detectives to find out that he was MS-13. And when you were told this, uh, did, were you given an explanation why DHS, Department of Homeland Security, never checked uh, his body? Uh, tattoos that would bring about, you know, suspicion or contact the government um, and to ask if he had affiliations or a prior criminal history? Did you ha have you had a chance to ask DHS about that failure? No, they, DHS and DHHS has failed to make a comment or say anything to me about Kayla or anything. Um, let me ask you, do you think, Ms. Nobles, that the secretary is doing everything he can uh, to secure that southern border? No. I, I know it's a, it comes across as a question that um, that anyone who's lost what you've lost, uh, you have the utmost right to, to be heard by the American people. It's one thing to abstract, talk about this. It's another thing to, to be victimized by someone's refusal to enforce what the law of the land is, what congressional law is. Um, if you were able to speak to Secretary Mayorkas, which, you know, uh, my inclination is he probably is paying attention, even though he's refusing to come and, and be a part uh, with the invitation that our chairman sent him. What would you say to Secretary Mayorkas, and what questions would you ask him? And I'll give you all the time you want. I'm going to end my conclusions there. Um, when you get done, Ms. Nobles, if there's time, Ms. Dunn, on the clock up here, I'd love to hear your comments as well. What would you tell the secretary? I would ask him, how did you allow a known gang member to be allowed in this country? How can anyone be okay with a known gang member to come into this country and to end up in Maryland? And I also wanted to know what else DHS and DHHS is hiding. I, found, um, I was told that her murderous file is so thick that Jim Jordan only had two hours to even look at the file. What else are they hiding about this murderer? I want to know. I mean, I'm not, you know, I want to know what they're hiding about this murderer. That's why, why, it, why he is being protected, why everything about him is being protected. We haven't even got to trial yet. Her trial is set for June 28th 
of this year, and they have four or five thick binders full of a bunch of evidence that we haven't even know yet. We don't even know over half of the stuff that was done to her in that room. And, I mean, I'm gonna ask you well, as a follow-up, I've got 30 seconds left. There's a statement that talks about, um, I actually quoted this to my orcas when he was before this committee. It actually uh, comes out of, of the Old Testament or the Torah. Um, where it talks about blood on your hands. If you see destruction coming, talking about a watchman, and you don't cry out, do you think the secretary, based upon him knowing what is happening, letting people come into this country, do you think he has blood on his hands? Yes, he is responsible for my daughter's death. Ms. Dunn? I, I know that Secretary Marcus has two daughters, and they're grown adults, and I'm... I just don't know how he would feel if it was one of his daughters that he lost to either one of these situations. We talked a little bit today about resources, okay? I have a resource in my purse. It's Narcan. It costs $45 in a pharmacy in Arizona. It's not free. You wanna spend some money? You wanna spend some of my tax dollars? Give this away for free. Everywhere, anywhere everywhere. That's what you need to spend your money on. I don't want to spend any more money on illegals. I want to save lives. Thank you. Gentleman Neons, I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Luttrell, for five minutes questioning. Thank you all for coming today. I, I, everyone in here said it. I spoke to my Democratic colleagues and my Republican colleagues, and our, our hearts are with you. And and um, I hope that doesn't seem meaningless coming from where we're sitting today. Unfortunately, you've, you've got to experience what Congress is all like right here in real life. And normally when you're watching C-SPAN, you can usually turn it off. Um, but this is, this is how we interact with each other, unfortunately. But thank you, and I'm very, very sorry for, for your loss. Um, I was a military man in my, my former life. And when forward deployed overseas, tasked with securing any given area, we followed that under the Constitution as military men, because we raised our right hand and swore to defend the Constitution of the United States. And sometimes our jobs were to prevent movement through any given space. Our job was to protect our men and women that were tasked underneath us wholeheartedly, unconditionally. And in war, you lose men and women, you do. It, it's just part of the conflict. Um, there's no great, there's, there's nothing you can, that can be said that, to anybody when that happens, um, but it is, it's absolute warfare. But as a military man, as an officer, if in any given space that I was defending, if it was rushed by individuals and overtaken, I would be relieved of command. Plain and simple, my leadership would look down at me like you failed, we're gonna relieve you of your duty. If I lost lives, and most likely, if it was negligent, I would be relieved of duty. Depending on the surge of numbers and however that played out, there, there could possibly have been a court-martial. And I lived by that, we all do. So when I, I see these numbers, and this is where I sit, why I'm going after the impeachment, is when I look to the leader that's supposed to be defending our country, and just numbers, I don't care if Democrat, Republican, just sheer numbers, yearly, since the Secretary has been in position, the numbers have grown exponentially, they have. Numbers of which, if that had happened to us overseas, it had been catastrophic, because if, if my leadership didn't take control and act accordingly, the Navy would have, and then it would have grown and grown and grown until we were held accountable. Each year, since Secretary has been in place, those numbers for fentanyl deaths, sex trade, gang members, not to mention the amount of addiction. We talk about deaths, but the addiction rate is astronomical. If those numbers were dipping down, that's one thing, but they're progressively getting worse and worse. They're out of control. Professor, my, my, I have a question for you. I know that you don't support the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas constitutionally. Do you support the removal, given the sheer numbers that we're seeing? 
do you support the removal or would you support the removal, period, of Secretary Mayorkas because of his failures to lead the Department of Homeland Security? I'm simply not an expert on immigration policy. No, it's a personal question. I really don't have a position on the removal of Secretary Mayorkas. Well, As a matter of law, I don't think the basis No, this is, this is a personal I know I know you say constitutionally that is not the case. You don't support that. And I understand that completely. I understand your perspective, and I appreciate it. But the United States is one of the leading countries in sex trafficking. Houston, Texas is the worst city in the country, which is in my district. I represent over 700,000 men and women in District 8 in the great state of Texas. And they are demanding the removal of Secretary of America, demanding it. And I'm the voice in Washington, D.C. to say, hey, I'm speaking for my people, and this is what they are demanding. So since the administration, President Biden will not remove Mr. Mayorkas constitutionally or however he sees it, and I understand your perspective. What I want to hear is, do you, do you think Mr. Mayorkas needs to be removed because of his failure, in my opinion, in his role? What I think you should tell your constituents in response to their demands is that they should vote for a different president. Well, that's, that's amen to that. I'm sure they're on board with that exact statement. But I do every day have to sit in front of the mothers and fathers of them that have lost their babies. And they're never going to get their babies back. And I can tell them to vote all day long, but four years it is an extremely long time to have somebody failing us in protecting our borders. So the Republican Party is having to act and act accordingly. And that's why this impeachment process is happening. I understand. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Dunn, Ms. Nobles. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you for your courage. Ms. Dunn happens to be a constituent of mine. She once confronted me at a town hall in Yavapai County and begged me to do something about this invasion at our southern border. Honestly, I couldn't blame her one bit. As a father, I would have done the exact same thing that you did, ma'am. Ms. Dunn, after listening to my Democratic colleagues today, I, I think you probably had a decent idea of what the problem was before you came up here. But I think it's a lot more in focus now, is it not? I'm glad you had a chance to confront the problem today. We will continue to confront the problem, but I'm glad you got a chance to see it for yourself. Ms. Pearlstein, you said during the audio recording that the chairman played, one of the criteria for impeachment is serious offenses against public trust. Do you still stand by this comment today, ma'am? As I've explained before, offenses against the public trust are instances in which an official is willfully acting for his own benefit or the benefit of his own power or on behalf of a foreign power. Thank you. How is this border crisis that has been planned and executed by Secretary Mayorkas not a serious offense to public trust, Ms. Pearlstein? Having read through the materials, I see no evidence that Secretary Mayorkas has acted on behalf of his own benefit, financially or politically, and I see no evidence that there is collusion or other cooperation or acting on behalf of Ma'am, do you see do you see evidence of betrayal of public trust? If you need help finding that, ma'am, look to your right. There's two mothers in here that have had their complete lives destroyed, their families destroyed. I'm going to ask Miss Dunn, do you have has your public trust in Secretary Mayorkas and the Department of Homeland Security been broken? Yes, sir. Ms. Nobles? Yes. Do you guys feel betrayed by Secretary Mayorkas and the Department of Homeland Security? You guys know his job is Secretary of Homeland Security. His job in his title is to protect the homeland, Homeland Security. Do you guys feel betrayed? Yes. I thought so. Ms. Pearlstein, are you familiar with Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, often known as the Invasion Clause? Yes, I've read the Constitution. That's not what I asked, ma'am. I asked if you're familiar with that yes. article. Yes, yes. Thank you. 
I'm going to read it. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government, and here's the, here's the point, and shall protect each of them against invasion. Ms. Nobles, Ms. Dunn, do you think that this Homeland Security Secretary is protecting this, these states against invasion? Is she protecting Arizona? Ms. Arizona Dunn? is not protected against invasion. Ms. Pearlstein, after having me read that, do you think that this secretary is protecting the 50 states against invasion? The word invasion in that clause is not in reference to migrants who are not trying to overthrow the government of the United States. Oh, it's interesting that you say that, ma'am. Very interesting that you say that. Ma'am, Ms. Pearlstein, have you ever studied unconventional warfare? Any idea what that term means? I've heard that term used. I'm what not an expert in unconventional warfare. You have any idea what it might mean? Go ahead, take a stab at it. I would rather hear your definition. Okay, great. Do you think in any wild and unprecedented strategy in the history of the world, one of our adversaries might try and send their soldiers to infiltrate our country using our wide open border, not putting them in uniforms and 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 having them come and present themselves in front of our border patrol agents and, and tell our border patrol agents, oh, we're just, we're, just, we're just innocent immigrants. We just want a better life. Do you think that's even possible, Ms. Pearlstein? Might anyone ever lie at the border? Yes. Okay. So it is possible that tens of thousands, you know that's how many we're getting a day, right, ma'am? About 10,000 a day, 10 to 15,000 a day. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of any statistics. Okay, well, I'll fill you in then, ma'am. You're in the Homeland Security Committee. It's about 10 to 15,000 often, sometimes 12,000 a day. That's more than a combat division coming to our southern border from 160 countries, some of which are adversarial. And I'm going to tell you right now, unconventional warfare has been used since the beginning of time. These people aren't stupid. They're using access to our country to bring in individuals who want to do harm to it. I've been, in the, I've been in the classified briefs. It's a fact, ma'am. How, how many families have to be ruined? How many mothers have to sit next to you before you come to understand this is an invasion of our country and he's in complete dereliction of duty of his constitutional oath to protect and defend the United States of America? How many, ma'am? Would, would we need to have 100 here today for you? Impeachment will not address the policy problem you describe. That's not a policy problem. That is him completely derelicting his oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. I read you the invasion clause. He is not doing that, ma'am. He's in complete dereliction of doing it in accordance with the other laws that other committee members have read to you today. And I think it's sad. This shouldn't be a partisan issue at all, and you know it. I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields. I now recognize Ms. Titus, the gentlelady from Nevada for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, uh, offer my deepest sympathy to the witnesses for their loss. Uh, Professor, you're the only expert in here on this topic. Would you say one more time for the record if co the Constitution covers what Mr. Crane called dereliction of his oath or any of the things that are being addressed here in terms of grounds for impeachment? I don't believe the record supports grounds for impeachment here, no. And are you in the mainstream of other constitutional scholars who have taken this position, written letters to the Post, written letters to our chairman, been public about this impeachment? I signed a letter that was um, in, in addition to another dozen or more bipartisan set of constitutional law scholars who took the same position. And I want to emphasize that was a bipartisan list of scholars who are uh, very versed in this topic and who know it better than any of us sitting up here. So um, I, it was interesting to me that when I heard Ms. Green and her tirade against you saying, we're not talking about the Constitution. She actually had the gall to say, we're not talking about the Constitution. And she's the one who entered the resolution that we are considering. So if we're not talking about the Constitution, what are we talking about? 
uh, well, we're wasting our breath talking about history, talking about precedent, talking about previous cases, talking about the language of the Constitution, talking about the original intent of the Constitution, because obviously the people on that side of the room are not talking about the Constitution. So they are throwing out 200 years of precedent. They're ignoring the interpretation of all these constitutional scholars. They're disregarding some of the comments that have been made by members of their own party about the folly of this uh, resolution and this pursuit. So if we're not talking about the Constitution, then what are we talking about? It's a political stunt. It's an attempt to distract from a do-nothing Congress that's done nothing, uh, and even less compared to the do-nothing Congress so named uh, by Truman. And, uh, you know, I actually another quote that I think is relevant. It was by the Assistant Secretary of Labor, uh, Mr. Post, who they brought up uh, to to uh, impeach in 1920. And by the way, it's only been done one time over 100 years ago, but they tried it in 1920. And his response was, it was mental dullness at high tension. I believe we've seen a lot of evidence today of mental dullness at high tension with raised voices, with misinformation, with accusations, with demeaning comments. That was mental dullness at high tension. So if we're not talking about the Constitution, we're just trying to use some constitutional terms to pretend like stump the professor. Uh, we know more than they do. Uh, I would say that my colleagues across the aisle are simply just trying to put lipstick on a pig. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member for his closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I compliment the gentlelady from Nevada, uh, even though you sound like you're from Mississippi uh, with your accent. Let me just say that uh, we've had um, about four and a half, five hours of hearing today uh, on this so-called impeachment. It's unfortunate because We've not heard any solutions being offered uh, in the course of this hearing. And because of that, uh, whatever the problem is will still be there unless we as Democrats and Republicans come together and work on solutions. But I'd like to start by thanking our witnesses for being here today and share their stories and expertise. Losing a loved one to drugs or violence is devastating, and our hearts go out to you and your families. Most of us here are family people, and uh, we can only um, give you our prayers uh, for the devastating loss that you've incurred. But I want to make sure that the record is clear. Secretary Mayorkas informed the majority last week of his scheduling conflict for today. And I'm sorry if the majority ne neglected to share that information with our witnesses. I'd also want to make very clear that Democrats are committed to enacting policies that will actually address these issues. Impeaching Secretary Mayorkas will do nothing to prevent other families from suffering similar tragedies, if only it were that simple. These problems are not new. They will require serious policy making. Not an impeachment vote will do nothing but undermine our constitutional system. If my Republican colleagues were serious about addressing these issues, they would be working on legislation, collaborating with our Senate counterparts and the White House. Right now, Congress has a pending request from President Biden to fund additional Border Patrol agents, additional law enforcement personnel, and increase fentanyl detection technology. House Republicans have refused to consider this request. Instead of pursuing solutions to these problems, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle 
are chasing an illegitimate impeachment and using tragedy to score political points. This entire process has been conducted in bad faith with a predetermined outcome. It's clear from my earlier parliamentary inquiries that the chairman has not established any due process or procedures for this sham of an impeachment. And the majority has refused to work with the department to find a day and time to hear from Secretary Mayorkas, despite his offer to do so. Let's not forget that my Republican colleague forced their border bill, HR2, through this committee without considering any democratic input, resulting in a bill full of unworkable provisions that would create chaos on the Southwest border. They know as well as anyone that HR2 never had a chance of becoming law. Senate Republicans and Democrats are working together in a bipartisan manner and with the direct involvement of Secretary Mayorkas to try to fix the issues raised here today. Yet instead of joining that conversation and using the powers of the Congress to create change, House Republicans are pursuing a partisan impeachment effort that will achieve nothing. Perhaps this is because a bipartisan reform bill would take away from a Republican political talking point. As one Republican member told CNN earlier this month, he has no interest in trying to pass border legislation that might help Joe Biden's approval rating. And that's nearly, and that's really what this impeachment sham is all about. A political game to make it seem like the do-nothing Republican caucus achieved something while attacking the Biden administration. And it's the American people that are paying the price of Republican inaction. This impeachment hearing just distracts from the important work that DHS is doing to secure the border and enforce immigration laws. So let me share some of that work. From May to September of 2023, DHS removed or returned at least 360,000 non-citizens from the United States, more than any other five-month period in the last 10 years. From April 2022 to September 2023, DHS arrested nearly 17,000 suspected human smugglers and seized more than $13 million in currency. And in fiscal year 2023, DHS stopped over 43,000 pounds of fentanyl from entering the country, resulting in over 5,600 arrests. President Biden has requested the necessary funding, but Republicans would rather shut down the entire federal government than give President Biden another win. Mr. Chairman, with other conclusions what other conclusion can the American people draw but that House Republicans don't actually want to fix the problem on our southern border? The Constitution gives Congress broad and expansive powers to create laws and shape the policies we want to see. It gives us strong tools to perform oversight over the execution of those policies. Yet, that's not what we've seen here today. Those real levels of power don't seem to be flashy enough for my Republican colleagues. They don't want to do the hard work of creating workable laws or collaborating or compromising. It's far easier to demand impeachment instead of engaging in a good faith effort to improve Homeland Security, House Republicans are more interested in giving interviews on Fox News. As Professor Pearlstein has explained today, there's no constitutional basis for impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. We heard the same from Professor Bowman last week, and we heard the same from the many other constitutional law experts that have written our committee. There's reason they have not brought a constitutional expert to testify in support of this impeachment. 
there are no constitutional basis for impeachment. Democrats will continue to keep our focus throughout this sham impeachment on what our obligations are under the Constitution. As I said last week, Mr. Chairman, when your members are ready to work and to use the actual power given to us by the framers to address policy problems, I guarantee you House Democrats will do our best to work with you. But until then, we'll continue to call out this do-nothing approach. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I would like to spend my closing statement reviewing why we've held impeachment proceedings against Secretary Maricus, since my Democrat colleagues still don't seem to get it. Secretary Maricus was, will, has willfully and systematically refused to follow immigration laws written by Congress. Indeed, he has unilaterally created policies that violate the statutory provisions of the immigration laws related to enforcement. In fact, most courts that have actually heard relevant arguments and decided on the merits agree. The problem is, when the arguments on enforcement went to the Supreme Court in the United States versus Texas, the court refused to decide the matter. The court said it was not subject to judicial review, and they pointed Congress to remedy the uh, impeachment. The court said, if the states can't get relief from the courts, they can get relief from Congress, who can impeach the offending official. Well, now Congress is the proper forum to resolve this dispute. We now have to decide, does the legislation enacted by the people's duly elected representatives mean anything? Or can the secretary just do whatever he wants in direct contradiction to the mandatory language in federal law with impunity? I argue that he cannot continue to not follow the law without consequences. This isn't a policy difference. This is a matter of following the laws written by Congress, and thus a matter of constitutional significance. Today's minority witness recognized back in 2019 that someone could be impeached for a breach of trust. James Madison, the primary architect of the Constitution, was elected to the House of Representatives to serve in the first Congress. At that time, a bill was proposed to create a Department of Foreign Affairs, now the State Department. Concerns were raised that if Congress created such a department, it could be filled by people who abused the public trust. Madison worried about it, and I quote, the difficulty of displacing those who are unworthy of the public trust, end quote. But he pointed to a solution for that concern. He said on the House floor, and I quote, if an unworthy man be continued in office by an unworthy president, the House of Representatives can at any time impeach him, and the Senate can remove him whether the president chooses or not, end quote. Now, I don't know about you, but I trust the interpretation of the father of our Constitution more than the interpretation of those desperate to defend the indefensible for political gain. The president has chosen to continue to keep an unworthy man in office, and it is now the duty of the House of Representatives to impeach Secretary Mayorkas and the Senate to remove him from office. The minority witness said we could pass laws to address these issues, but to what end? The Secretary has already shown he will not follow the laws passed by Congress. Secretary Mayorkas has consistently and deliberately violated duly enacted laws under the Immigration and Nationality Act that Congress has put into place to protect Americans and guard our nation's sovereignty. Secretary Mayorkas has refused to comply with court orders regarding those very laws in good faith. Additionally, Secretary Mayorkas has on numerous occasions lied or misled the United States Congress and the American people regarding the existence and scale of the border crisis that he created. Secretary Mayorkas told the House Judiciary Committee on April 20, 2022 that he had operational control of the southern border, according to the definition laid out by the Secure Fence Act. By the way, that definition was passed into law by Joe Biden, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton. 
And of course, Secretary Mayorkas, his own former Border Patrol chief, testified before this committee in March of last year that according to the statute, DHS does not have operational control. Secretary Mayorkas's pure dishonesty was on full display. Again, not a policy issue. To those claiming this impeachment hearing is against the Constitution and against the separation of powers, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas are the ones who have trampled on the Constitution and the separation of powers by ignoring a co-equal branch of government. As far as I understand the Constitution, the Constitution I swore an oath to at age 17 on the plane at West Point, Congress writes the laws and the executive branch executes those laws. But that is exactly, absolutely not what Secretary Mayorkas has been doing when it comes to our country's immigration laws. In fact, he's been spitting on those laws and thus the Constitution in the last three years. Impeachment is our final remedy. We're left with no other choice. This is also not a resource issue. Democrats are wrong when they claim that the reason this border crisis is happening is because there aren't enough resources at the border and that Republicans have refused to fund the Border Patrol. First of all, House Republicans have voted substantial increases in funding for CBP above the President's requested amount. In fact, funding the Border Patrol operations and related Southwest border requirements increased $2.2 billion over our, since FY 2021. Additionally, House Republicans, in the FY24 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, where we fund the government, increased border security funding again above the President's proposed budget. On top of this, H.R. 2, the Secure Border Act, would fund a Border Patrol force of 22,000. Yet, did any Democrat here vote for that? No. It's the definition of hypocrisy. Secondly, Secretary Mayorkas actually asked for less money each year to fund detention. The one thing that is a deterrent to people coming and making that trek. Third, it won't matter how many resources we have at the border if the policies don't change and follow the laws written by Congress. President Biden's supplemental package would do nothing to secure the border between ports of entry, and it would do nothing to stop the flow of migrants to our border. No, every cent of Biden's supplemental package would go directly toward funding mass catch and release policies. That is a non-starter. That's what's created the crisis in the first place. This is clearly not an issue of funding. DHS has less fun had less funding under the Trump administration for border security, yet our border was far more secure. Funding Biden's supplemental package won't fix the crisis at the border. It will fund it. Again, it's not a funding problem. Secretary Mayorkas's complete disregard for the laws passed by Congress have had a devastating impact. That's what we learned today. Everyone knows the numbers. As one Texas sheriff has said, and I quote, it's quite frankly a tsunami of death that has crashed into the United States over our southern border. It's killing Americans wholesale, and it's just an epic slaughter manufactured by the cartels. If you don't secure the border, it is going to continue, end quote. Slaughter is the right word to describe what fentanyl is doing to our country, to our young people, to many of our sons and daughters. What else do you call 100,000 overdose deaths in 2021? And a comparison was made earlier today between incarceration rates of native citizens and immigrants. Well, whatever that is, it misses the point that every crime committed by anyone who's here illegally is a completely preventable crime. If you shut the border, those lives are saved. To prevent those crimes, you need only enforce the immigration laws on the books, which is exactly what Secretary Mayorkas is willfully not doing. This hearing is titled, Voices for the Victims, the Heartbreaking Reality of the Mayorkas Border Crisis. Tammy Nobles, daughter Kyla Marie Hamilton, no longer has a voice. Josephine Dunn's daughter, Ashley Marie Dunn, no longer has a voice. 
That's why we held this hearing today. It is our duty to be the voices of those who can't speak for themselves and to demand accountability on their behalf. And finally, to Secretary Mayorkas, who couldn't be bothered to show up today. Secretary Mayorkas, you have one job. Follow the laws and secure the homeland. Yet you allow criminal aliens to walk across our border, to spit in the face of our country's laws, and to exploit vulnerable migrants. Secretary Mayorkas, you have one responsibility. Follow the law and secure the homeland. Yet you allow massive amounts of fentanyl to flow across the border and poison tens of thousands of Americans. Secretary Mayorkas, you have one duty to follow the law and secure this homeland, yet you refuse to let our Border Patrol do its job and keep criminal aliens from coming across the border or allow ICE to deport all criminal aliens when caught. You had one job, one responsibility, one duty, and you have refused to fulfill it. Over and over again, you have refused to follow the laws and to secure our homeland, yet you shrink your responsibility. This is utterly disgraceful. Now, I'd like to make a few other points. Someone today has made a point, I can't recall if it was a member or the minority witness, that if you remove the secretary, there'll be no change because they'll just put another guy in there like that. Well, I have a duty to the people of Tennessee and the people of America that if we have a lawless cabinet secretary who refuses to obey the laws written by Congress, and who refuses court orders to cease and desist, totally disrespecting the two other equal branches of government in our Constitution, I have a duty under the Constitution to remove him. And it doesn't matter if the devil I don't know is worse than the devil I do. My duty is to remove him, and I will do my duty. There have been some... I think we'll say disingenuous comments about our efforts to get Mr. Mayorkas here today. We have tried for months and months to get him to come and testify on the border issues. The only time he's come is when he's constitutionally or legally mandated to present uh, the national threats briefing. He came with the director. I, I was glad he was here for that. He has not worked with me to be here. In fact, today he decided to meet with some Mexican officials who come from Mexico instead of being present at this hearing. That ought to tell you where his priorities are. Now, some people have suggested, of course, that we could pass some more legislation. Well, again, I did say, what's the use if, you're, if he's not going to abide by it? But you know what? H.R. 2 sits over there on the other side of the building. Well, actually, it's that way. I'm not directionally challenged. It's that way. Amend it. Take the parts you don't like out of it. I think that's the process. And then it comes back over here. We go to conference committee and we work it out. You don't just sit and leave it sitting on a desk and say, you don't, you don't, not writing legislation. Well, yeah, we sent it to you. And the process is you amend it in your committee, vote on that amended version in the Senate, and send it back to conference. So don't sit there and say we haven't done anything. That was months ago. And I, I have to address the ranking member's suggestion that we would use these young women as political pawns to make a political statement. I am offended by that. His, his closing remarks could have been made at a political rally. It's despicable to suggest that I would use the two of you as political stunts. I'm trying to show that every American is unsafe right now with these ridiculous border policies. What happened to you ladies and your daughters could happen to any American. And the reason they've happened is because the secretary isn't following the laws passed by this body, both Republicans and Democrats. And if he were a Republican, I'd be saying the exact same thing. It has nothing to do with politics for me. 
spent 24 years prepared to give my life for this country. And at times I thought I might have. No, what matters to me is that document that I swore an oath to defend. And this secretary has spit on it by saying that co-equal branches of government don't matter to him. I'm sorry, he's got to go. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittees may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we would ask that the witnesses respond to those in writing pursuant to Committee Rule 7D. The hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Chairman. Without objection, the ranking member is recognized. You know, we've talked several times about the rules, and we can disagree. Uh, we're Democrats and Republicans. But I, I call your attention to House rules that uh, you referenced my comments and that, that they were despicable. That's against House rules. Actually, calling you despicable would be against House rules. Calling your words despicable are not. I, am, well, I can even say it's dishonest what you said. I can't say you're a liar. It's well, very clear, and I've made that distinction before, actually gaveling down comments made by a, Dem a Republican. She actually, in that case, called the secretary a liar. She didn't say, others, now even uh, others have said that those words are dishonest or that that's a lie. You can say that. You can't say the individual is a liar. Well, Her words were despicable. Well, you, I didn't say anything about you personally. Well, then, then I'm clear, as long as you didn't make Ben and Thompson. Yeah, I would never say that, that well, about about a, an individual sitting in this Thank committee. You. But I was very disappointed with your accusation well, that I would that, use well, these well, individuals well, as political well, pawns. Mr. Chairman, uh, your disappointment is fine. But one of the, the tenets of, of who we are as a democracy is that I have a, an opinion. And you have an opinion. And, and let's respect that. And, and so as long as you understand that we don't have to we can disagree on the words. I was just trying to get clarification uh, about that. And since you say you weren't talking uh, about me specifically, then I'm fine. I yield back. Gentleman Yields, uh, the committee stands adjourned.